both consumers and companies have been more resilient than really the consensus expected. That wall of money is out there spending, and particularly on services. We think that these recession headwinds are going to catch up with us. The bigger risk is that the Fed loses its resolve in the face of this weakness and allows inflation to become entrenched. We're probably at one of those precipices right now where we're peaking in optimism. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen from New York on a Monday, radio and television. The markets, yes, we will look at equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. But Lisa, after an extraordinary weekend, it is Bloomberg International Relations for the next three hours. Everyone wants to understand what actually happened over the weekend with respect to uh, this march on Moscow by the Wagner Group, by Prigozhin, who uh, had been an ally of Vladimir Putin, and then what this means longer term in terms of Vladimir Putin's uh, reign and just the war in Ukraine in general. Oh, it's going to be interesting to see. We're going to go to Maria Tadeo here in a moment to get an update on this. She will appear in the 7 o'clock with Amory Horton, and Lisa, Lisa will tell you about some of our wonderful guests uh, coming up to give you perspective. We're going to focus on the news and the reporting as we aggregate all the news sources here, Bloomberg and all the rest, reporting on the facts as we see them of this huge event. Lisa, I was stunned at the the rumors and the back and forth and the expert. I I was looking for you out on Twitter being a, being a Russian <laughs> well, expert there at midnight. Well, that's true. Everyone gets to be a, a Russian expert overnight. Here's the issue right now. Nobody really knows, right? What don't yes. we understand right now? We don't understand what the motivation was in the march on <clears throat> Moscow. What was behind it? Was it was just Prigozhin and the Wagner uh, upset and anger about the lack of provisions? Was this something else funded from somewhere else? We do not understand. We don't know the longer-term ramifications for Vladimir Putin, for his relationship at the top of the nation, but also with Xi Jinping over in China. These are all the questions right. percolating. But I think that the takeaway here is it heightens uncertainty. Fascinating that we come into a market little right. changed at a time when people don't understand which side of the tail risks to really hang on to. And what Bloomberg News has done all through the weekend is to try to bring you legit experts on this moment. Please stay with us through the morning on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. Lisa's going to give you the surveillance names, including Dr. Bremer is scheduled to join us here at some point. And then later on, and this is the interview I will pay the closest attention to, the tank general from the United States Army, Ben Hodges, will join us in the 10 o'clock hour. Uh, I believe that's with Alex Steele. And Alina Polakova was one of the few people out on Twitter with common sense sense in the heat of this. I can't remember. I think it was, was Saturday night. I, I can't remember, but I'm thrilled to have Dr. Polakeva with us. Um, as well. What's your observation on this, Lisa? Well, I think that really what I find interesting <clears throat> is the markets are inconclusive about what the implications are. They're just as confused as everybody else. And the stasis that you're seeing, yes, you are seeing a bit of a lift in natural gas prices over in Europe. But other than that, it's unclear yeah. what people see as the longer term ramifications. <clears throat> My larger observation is there are cracks in the armor behind Vladimir Putin because there are yes. real questions about his leadership and who was opposing yeah. the Wagner Group in that march. Uh, the data check quickly here. Futures at negative six. I'm watching Renminbi gives way here 7.24 and a stunning and weaker Chinese uh, yuan. Yes, ruble is weaker back a certain number of months as expected. And in the economic slowdown discussion, yields lower this morning on the global economy in West Texas Intermediate 69.40. I guess you're briefing us, including Dr. Bremer's appearance. Yeah, Dr. Bremer is going to be <clears throat> joining us at 8.15 a.m., also joining us around 7.45 a.m. as Lieutenant General, uh, former uh, retired Lieutenant General David Deptula, also on the Academy Securities Advisory Board. Very curious to see what he has to say. 10.30 a.m., the latest on a slew of data that we get this week, U.S. Dallas Fed manufacturing activity. This comes after a slew of disappointing That's an reads. an ugly chart. Exactly. <clears throat> and how much does this continue to point to recession, which is what people People are wondering about. And 1.30 p.m., the <clears throat> Cintra conference, the basically uh, Jackson Hole of Europe, kicks off. ECB President Christine Lagarde is giving opening remarks uh, at this ECB <laughs> forum on central banking around uh, 1.30 p.m. today. Right now, let's get to Maria Tadeo here. Uh, she has been working on this tirelessly through the weekend and really trying to correlate all of the reporting and news that's out there. Uh, Maria Tadeo is in Brussels. What is the latest, Maria? 
Well, Tom, what we know is that now the Russian state media in the past hour has said that this idea that Vladimir Putin and the Russian state would not launch a probe into Prigozhin for his insurrection is not the case, <clears throat> that the probe has not been dropped and that potentially continues. And that is significant because if you go back to Saturday, the idea was that Alexander Lukashenko, the head of Belarus, had mediated between Vladimir Putin and Prigozhin to avoid a bloodshed in Moscow. And there was somehow a peacemaking deal. Now, if the Russians decide to go after uh, Prigozhin and they do indeed continue this probe, it means there is no such deal. Do we have a sense, Maria, of what the internal discussions are about Vladimir Putin's leadership and why there wasn't more opposition to the Wagner troops as they did march on Moscow? Well, what we did see on Saturday, well, first of all, is the Russian president who addressed the nation and said, this is treason, and he mentioned 1917. Obviously, that's a crucial date in Russian history. He talked about tragic repercussions and critical consequences for this. Then, of course, after that, uh, we saw, or the day, well, there would be no probe. But now we see this morning that the Russians are saying that probe has not been dropped. So that would signal that, again, this deal cut by the Belarusians is actually, well, thin paper, and, and there's no such deal. Uh, the other issue is we have not actually seen from the Russian president since Saturday, but we did see today what seemed to be uh, the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, allegedly on a helicopter inspecting <laughs> Russian troops. Now, again, we don't know when this was recorded. We don't know when this was filmed. We know that Russians release tape that was at times or at times can be filmed months, weeks uh, prior, but it would signal a strong message, and that is the defense minister of Russia continues to be Shoigu and has the backing of the Kremlin. Remember, a lot of the tensions over the past few months between Prigozhin and the Russian state had to do over what he claimed to be the mismanagement of the Russian army by Shogu. Today, miraculously, magically, he appears on tape inspecting troops. Do we have a sense, Maria, of how much the, the Chinese leadership is involved right now? We know that we have met over the weekend, but in terms of how they're trying to push the situation one way or another in order to keep their alliance with Vladimir Putin. Well, it's, it's very quiet, and in fact, we have not seen any major contact between Vladimir Putin and uh, the Chinese leader. And Vladimir Putin was busy on Saturday uh, on the phone with what he perceives are his international allies, and he did make a call to Turkey and spoke to Erdogan, who said, I support uh, Vladimir Putin against what he described was a coup, but he was not on the phone with the Chinese, at least not in a way that we know openly. To me, it's interesting uh, this morning, the top European diplomat, again, going back to this idea of Prigozhin, he right. says Russia and Vladimir Putin created a monster, and that monster is right. still alive, which by itself is surprising. Maria, see you in the next hour. Maria, today you're uh, coalescing all of our coverage in continental Europe over what's going on in Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. Right now we turn to the markets, and they are markets looking for economic slowdown. Jeffrey Yu joins us, senior market strategist, Bank of New York Mellon. How close are we to global recession, Jeff Yu? Uh, well, uh, not uh, super close yet, but if I look at the Eurozone IFO surveys, you know, this notion that only a technical recession uh, in Europe, which is not um, going to be prolonged, uh, I think uh, the ECB may need to revisit that. You know, so, you know, tonight's uh, uh, you know, speech and the speeches over the next few days and by the hawks um, on the ECB, uh, I think they're going to have to be very, very careful with their language because uh, they may now be edging into the over-tightening camp, and that's always bad for global growth. <clears throat> the the over-tightening camp is there, and I, I guess this is a demonstrable linkage between what we've witnessed over the weekend. Are the events in the international fragility of Russia enough to derail the tendencies or the oomph of central banks? Uh, I think right now they'll just be uh, observant uh, and uh, see what the wider ramifications are. Of course, um, if uh, this is not the end of it, uh, and I think many in markets do not think this is going to be the end of it, of course, uh, there will be repercussions and central banks uh, will then react accordingly. But ultimately, it's about demand versus inflation. And again, in the Eurozone, on the continent, and Russia, of course, will play uh, into this. Uh, we are seeing clear signs of a demand slowdown. And I think that's something that needs to be reacted to. UK is in a different place, uh, uh, of course. And then, of course, there's 
also the China situation not getting any better. So you, as a Eurozone policymaker, will need to ask yourself, where's going to be the demand? Where's going to be the risk appetite? It just doesn't seem to be there right now. Jeff, I'm curious, as I came in today, about what kind of tail risks were heightened on both sides mm -hmm. and which would seem as the more likely tail risk. It seems evenly balanced right now, whether you get a quick end to the Ukrainian <coughs> war, and that leads to a real rally, or whether we uh, unleash exogenous threats, considering mm -hmm. a leadership vacuum at the helm of one mm -hmm. of the nuclear powers. How are you expecting this to be played out by market participants? Uh, I think you know, market participants, you know, after last year, you know, there was a tail risk which they didn't anticipate. They'll be far more attuned to that uh, right now, looking at their geopolitical analysis, you know, looking uh, at uh, you know, what um, assets are reacted to uh, the worst case scenarios of tail risk um, coming through. And I think the dollar will benefit uh, accordingly you know, on the back of that. Uh, and also, on top of these developments, I think risk appetite unwinding, you know, due to global growth concerns, that was uh, on the way in any case. So we're seeing very good buying of dollar in our underlying <coughs> flow data. This carry trade, you know, led by commodity currencies, high yielders, and dare I say it, uh, AI stocks and things like that, that seems to be on the cusp of unwinding. You know, these things you know, on the margins cannot advance much further. So we are you know, looking at risk probably softening in the short term. You don't want tail risk to compound that. This is fascinating. So in other words, you think that the trade over the next few months is going to be stronger dollar, weaker tech after the biggest rally in tech stocks ever for the first half of a year? I think we really need to be very tactical about this, um, but stronger dollar against those high yielding currencies, against those high risk beta <coughs> assets, which have done well over the past quarter or so. Uh, hence, um, you know, even with the Fed perhaps uh, hiking once or twice or more, we're looking at perhaps once more at this point, that idiosyncratic nature, U.S. exceptionalism, it's still very much in play. Jeff, I've, I've got to go narrow here with you. Thunderstruck to walk in today, and of course we're all distracted by what's going on uh, in Europe. And I see dollar renminbi out to a stunning 7.24. You got to tell me that it's a managed move by Beijing here. Where's their tolerance on weaker yuan? Mm. Um, they will tolerate a weaker yuan absolutely as long as it's in line with their interest rate cuts, as long as it's in line with their easing. It's not about levels. It's about the pace. They're going to start yeah. sounding like the BOJ. They don't like these uh, disruptive moves. But let's get this straight here. We go back to real rates. You know, if you want real rates lower, you cannot have a stronger currency. End of. And that's what they're managing right now. Jeffrey, you thank you so much. Uh, greatly appreciate it with BNY Mellon thank you. Uh, this morning. I mean, Lisa, it's hard to focus here on the data here. And we're going to give you what we see in the market, some great guests coming up. Michael Darda, I believe, scheduled to be with us later. But I walk in, and, you know, we're all distracted by what's the news flow uh, with, with Putin and the rest. And there's Ren Minby with, you know, not to, yeah, okay, I'll accentuate it, a moonshot out to 7.24. Wow. Yeah, they tightened, or they, uh, they <clears throat> set a peg that was stronger than people expected, which raises questions about what they're going for and how they're going to try to play, especially after the data. Did you get the retail sales data in China, and it was highly disappointing over the holiday season. <clears throat> 2.6 standard deviations out, which is not a big deal for a lot of currencies, but for a managed currency like China, you know, they're well behaved. That doesn't happen too often. The bigger question to me is there are three themes today. <clears throat> It's on one hand, you've got obviously the geopolitical concerns around Russia. You have the question of the biggest tech rally, the biggest rally in tech shares for the first six months of a year ever going back and whether it's fading. And then you also have this idea, what does this do to the inflationary pressures right around the world? The fact that we do have more hawkish central banks. And to me, as we drive toward both the Sintra conference as well as a slew of economic data, how do we put these together? You asked the right question, Tom. How do central bankers stick to their guns if they're looking at such great well, geopolitical uncertainty? Yeah, I mean, I have no expertise on this, but to me, it's, it, it's more than a distraction. And I like the reporting today from Bloomberg News, from the FT, from the Telegraph, who are desperately trying not to do opinion or speculation. But we're just looking at facts. As, as Maria mentioned, there's a video of the defense leader Shoigu, was it made before the coup? Right, we don't we know. We don't know. We have no idea. There's a lot of, uh, you know, <clears throat> unclear information, and that's been clouding a lot of any assertions that people can make. One thing that's clear, this increases the uncertainties. So the tail risks are going to be more significant on both sides. One thing that's clear, we've got lots coming up. Mark Anderson, UBS Global Wealth Management, will join us here, and I believe Tina Fordham in the next couple uh, minutes. She was brilliant over the weekend on Russia. Futures at negative six, down futures, negative 20. Maria today on Henry Horton in the next hour. This is Bloomberg. Good morning.
you're seeing some very serious cracks emerge. Um, you have uh, Prigozhin uh, publicly questioning the very premise for this uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine in the first place, uh, the notion that somehow Ukraine or NATO presented a threat to, uh, to Russia. Uh, you have someone challenging uh, Putin's leadership very publicly and very openly. Uh, and very openly. We see cracks uh, emerging where they go, if, if, if anywhere. Uh, wh when they get there, very hard to say. I don't want to speculate on it. Uh, but I don't think we've seen the final act. The Secretary of State with ABC on Sunday saw that live. It was really quite something to hear him uh, scrambling amid the non-news of Sunday uh, morning. We welcome all of you. Bloomberg Surveillance, John Farrow's on assignment, Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keene. We and the team have worked through uh, the weekend. We have Bremer in the 8 o'clock hour. I think General Hodges will be with us in the 10 o'clock hour and on to some other expert as well. Tina Fordham to join us here uh, in a moment. Which headline this morning on Russia captures you, Lisa? This question around whether there actually is any assurance for Prokhorov that he is safe in Belarus. This has always been a question. Why Putin allowed someone who he called a traitor to get away with amnesty in Belarus, whether he would go back on that? Reports, early reports suggest we don't know. Uh, on the other hand, what are his plans? He has an entire team in Africa and various African nations, the Wagner troops. They have an incredible presence around the world. Is he going to go helm them, right? I mean, what's going to happen with all of these no. potential uh, leadership roles around the world? Huge uncertainty out there right now. We'll try to bring you the facts uh, this morning. One of the facts was Twitter was different this time around. I guess it's Mr. Musk. I'll let you decide. But one of the calm and collected voices through Saturday and Sunday was Tina Fordham, founder and geopolitical strategist at Fordham Global uh, Foresight, giving perspective, but perspective not off speculation and rumors, perspective off the news. Tina Fordham, when you look at the news flow that we have, what captures your attention this morning? In some ways, Tom, I'm, I'm looking at what isn't happening or what hasn't happened, the, the counterfactual. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm almost waiting for for Russian TV to start playing Swan Lake, which they have a habit of doing uh, when times get difficult. Um, there is a real air of, of caution and pause um, that's prevailing, whether that's Secretary of State Blinken's comments, which were quite measured, uh, as you just played, whether or not the, the tape of, of Defense Minister <coughs> Shoigu is, is uh, recent or not. We haven't seen Putin. Uh, as Lisa said, Prigozhin, is it a deal? Is it not a deal? We shouldn't assume that these are coordinated actions. Um, and I think that's really important right. to... Market participants tend to, to look for uh, data points, you know, forming a trend line, and we don't have that yet. Tina, when I give speeches on this and on the humility of being totally wrong, my great Tina Ford a moment was I was totally wrong on Boris Yeltsin. The way that Boris Yeltsin collapsed, are there allusions to that with Mr. Putin in the coming months? Well, absolutely. And, and this is where I think political science is helpful. Uh, authoritarian regimes um, can consolidate uh, around an indiv individual, as Putin has done over the past 23 years. They can shut down all forms of dissent. Uh, but that means that they tend to, to be brittle and um, to break rather than, than bend. Um, this, this script, you know, Prigozhin has gone off the reservation with his remarks, which have blown holes through all of the narratives that the West has been fed, that Russia was forced to invade because of NATO expansion, uh, because of violation of human rights of Russian speakers, et cetera. No, Prigozhin said this is because they ran out of stuff to right. loot. In, in Donbass, uh, you know, in Donetsk and Luhansk. But this, Tina, that's exactly where I wanted to go. Why didn't Vladimir Putin shut him down months ago when he started to release these types of commentary out there? Do we have a sense of why Prigozhin was allowed to have a voice that very few people in Russia have been allowed to have about this war? The only, well, there are two possible explanations, and they, they can both coexist. One is that Putin needs him, that uh, Prigozhin provides services uh, which Putin still values, which would also explain uh, why he hasn't had any polonium tea <clears throat> just yet um, in, in exile in, in Belarus. 
And the other is, you know, we have really overcredited Putin, as we tend to do with other kind of opaque uh, regimes, with, you know, controlling all the strings and playing three-dimensional chess. Uh, it is a, a, you know, kind of a, a, a rookie mistake, a violation of authoritarianism 101 to support competing armed militias, but Putin has always specialized in KGB style divide and conquer. So having these competing power centers like the defense ministry and Wagner and their other militias as well has suited him because then these guys fight each other. It's the bulldogs under a rug, as Churchill said, rather than posing a threat to him. There's a real question here about China's response to a potential loss of Vladimir Putin's power. And this has been uh, evident over the weekend meetings. What are you watching there in terms of what China would like to see and how they are interceding into any negotiations with Belarus, with Vladimir Putin, or just staying out of it? Uh, China will not want to intervene, uh, but for sure they are sweating. Uh, ever since um, President Xi's remarks of a friendship without limits, I, I think that there was buyer's remorse pretty soon after that happened. Remember, that was early February, and the invasion happened thereafter. Um, let's look for, for statements coming from officials. They've been very modest so far, talking about internal domestic disturbances. Um, but as much as, as Putin has caused global disruption, which is something that China doesn't like, I think whether we're talking about Washington or Beijing, there's enormous concern of who would replace him. And I had this <clears throat> moment of terror as Prigozhin was getting closer to the Kremlin, and I thought, what if he actually goes for it and there's a palace coup, and I won't be the only one who, who thought about that. Tina, I'm, and this is your wheelhouse, I'm absolutely fascinated what the intelligenza, that's a fancy word, Lisa. I, I don't really know how to pronounce it. Intelligentsia. Amy, Amy had to help me with that. <laughs> intelligenza, or the elites, or the oligarchs, the fancy people in Russia and outside Russia, can they shape the events in Moscow and St. Petersburg? Uh, I suspect that they're finding out just how little political capital they have. I mean, again, we assume that these are sort of closed systems uh, that are controlled from the top, and they are much more chaotic uh, than, than we realize. One of the things that political science uh, talks about is negative loyalty. That means nobody piped up and said a word in defense of Putin, uh, which you might have expected <clears throat> if he still was a going proposition in terms of a power source. What do kleptocrats do in a situation like this? Figure out how to keep as much of right. their stuff as possible. That's what will be happening now. Tina, thank you so much for the brief. Tina Fordham, we're really providing leadership coverage over the weekend uh, in the zeitgeist, if you will, with Fordham Global uh, Foresight. I, I was thunderstruck of, you know, this big international events like we've had other ones, including February, a year and a bit ago when the war started. But wow, how Twitter has changed. I was bedazzled by what I observed in my lousy feed this weekend. I was, I was looking for Red Sox baseball, and it wasn't there. There's a fascination <clears throat> right now over a drama that is so uncertain. And reading all of the newspapers over the weekend, regardless of Twitter, the newspapers don't have a clue either. And I think that what Tina just said there was really telling. What we don't know possibly tells us well, more than what we know in terms of the lack of visibility on Vladimir Putin, the lack of visibility on the two generals that helm his particular particular troops, the lack of understanding of what the agreement is, all of these questions around motivation, which is still unclear, and the goals. That, to me, remains the biggest, most interesting aspect over the weekend. To aggregate this for you, our Bloomberg big take this morning centers on Mr. Putin facing historic threat to his total grip on power. The Financial Times, Prigozhin still faces charges, says Russian state media. The Telegraph of London, Russian agent threat to family, uh, made the Wagner leader call off the Moscow advance. Some of the reporting done today. We will continue here with our coverage and, of course, also continue to look at these markets which signal global slowdown. Futures, negative seven. This is Bloomberg surveillance.
Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning on a Monday, but a very, very different Monday. Emery Horton and Maria Tadeo will join us in the next hour. Dr. Bremer will join us in the 8 o'clock uh, on to General Hodges in the 10 o'clock hour. Uh, with further discussion of all the events, we'll keep you up to date on the reporting on these events from Russia, from Belarus, and from, of course, uh, Ukraine. Anything from Washington and London will probably parachute that in. Maria today insists we do that. Uh, Elisa, right now the market uh, response here futures negative seven. I'm going to call it a slight weight to the tape. Nasdaq with a little greater percentage move. VIX out of stick, full point, 14.50. Lisa, we haven't even mentioned this in the the Russia focus this morning. Yields. I, I'm going to use a very fancy CFA phrase. They're nuts. The uh, 210 spread out to 102 uh, basis points shows that yield coming in on the distant paper, the 10-year yield. What I find interesting is that the moves are not bigger this morning. And right now, we're seeing a bit of a grinding in the same direction that we saw perhaps on Friday. But we're not seeing a wholesale shift, even though the news over the weekend caused people to go into their desks <clears throat> and really scrutinize every bit of information. To me, people still trying to assess, do we go to our playbook that we had for a hot second, or do we have to shift it all over again? Currency is somewhat of a stability here. Again, American oil, 69, 62, a little bit under. There is discussion of global slowdown, of course, the iconic statement of the last 100 days was at the International Monetary Fund meetings, looking out three years, five years of true lethargy in the global economy. Somebody who's lived this for decades is Carl Weinberg. He's chief economist at High Frequency Economics. And as the adult in the room, he is focused on the lofty climbs of Sintra in Portugal, one of the most beautiful towns in Europe where the elite will meet to greet here. Carl Weinberg, explain to our audience why Sintra matters to you. Hi, good morning, Tom. Good morning, Lisa. You know, I'm looking at Sintra, and we've got an opportunity for key central bankers to explain themselves. Uh, the big <laughs> show is going to be on Wednesday, when we're going to have Fed Chair Powell uh, on the same stage as Christine Lagarde, as uh, Andrew Belly of the United Kingdom, and um, as uh, Ueda-san from the Bank of Japan. And this is a chance for the four of them to explain together not only how their policies are working for their own countries, but how their policies are working together to bring global inflation to a halt without killing the economy. And in the background, world trade contracted in April, according to the latest data from the Dutch Central Planning Broad. And, and every time we've seen world trade contract over the last 60, 70 years, there have been five episodes of world trade contraction, and every one of them has led to a slowdown or a recession in the global economy. So this is not a good sign right. that we're seeing out there. There's a lot of stuff on the table. The dynamics right now, bank to bank, of traditional monetary policy, it may be something like Hixie and ISLM theory, or name four other major theories, including monetarist theory. Does Carl Weinberg have an operating theory right now, or is the only theory we're coming out of a pandemic? Well, you know, we have. I have a, a surprisingly positive outlook for all the countries in the world economy, despite the slowdown in trade. I'm not sure whether the slowdown in trade is an anomaly or whether it's an actual real signal. And I look at, at the economies involved. Let's X Japan out of this, but U.S., Euroland, U.K. And while uh, the U.K. economy and Euroland are in a, a tough mess right now, they're at full employment. The unemployment rate in Europe is the lowest it's been since EMU. U.K. unemployment is, is near historic lows. U.S. unemployment is at epical lows. So we're at full employment, and inflation is slowing. And by a year from now, inflation will be back down pretty much where, where the central banks want it to be, or very, very close to it. So I'm thinking about a world at, at full employment. I'm thinking about a world at, with price stability. And I'm thinking about a world with positive real interest rates. That's the missing piece. And uh, I'm wondering where the central banks are going. But I'm trying to be very optimistic that we're just in a rough patch right now in Europe, in the UK, slowing a bit in the United States but that by a year from now, we'll be at full employment and growing again. Uh, and I, I just have to power my way around this declining world trade and see where we end up after it all settles down. When was the last time, Carl, that you were this positive? You know, probably, uh, let's see, in the 1960s, maybe. 
somewhere, uh, you know, around the time of graduating high school. Uh, I tend to look, uh, historically, I've tended to look at the dark side, and I've sort of viewed uh, my my role in the financial markets as being the person who thinks about what goes wrong. And a lot can go wrong. But I, I've just been looking at these employment reports. I look at the U.S. employment data. You know, I sit in my chair. I look at my Bloomberg. I look at the numbers. I say, we're at full employment. What's the problem? I look at the U.K. data. We're at full employment. I look at Europe. Everyone who wants a job is finding a job. You know, that's a success story. Oh. If we have a little bit of inflation now, and maybe we'll get less inflation in a year, monetary and fiscal policy are in place to make that happen. So maybe something good can come out of this. Maybe policy can finally get us to where we want to be uh, for a change. I love the optimism. We do get a lot of naysayers on this program regularly. And what they would say, what can go wrong? It would be the big event in Sintra, where you have Jay Powell, Christine Lagarde, uh, Andrew Bailey, a host of other central bankers who don't necessarily have the confidence that you do that inflation will continue to go downward in a material way. How concerned are you about them continuing with hawkish rhetoric and hawkish actions that curtail the dynamism that you're talking about? Well, Lisa, just looking at the, the headline CPIs, which after all are the target of the inflation target, are, are the object of the inflation targets that we have out there, and just taking into account the basis effects and doing trend extrapolations, we get inflation back down to target by the first quarter of next year in all three of the economies I just mentioned, US, UK, Euroland. And that's pretty good. You know, uh, and that doesn't involve any economics. That's just arithmetic moving the, the, the CPI forward by the seasonal factors only. So uh, that's like a base case that says that unless something goes wrong, we're going to get there in a year. And that may not be as fast as the central banks want to get there. And that's what they're telling us. And that's why they're continuing to hike rates. But I have a, a theory, a personal view, nobody's told me this, that the central bankers want to get real interest rates in the 2 to 3 percent range. That's their target, having been at negative real policy rates for 15 years since the financial crisis. Uh, a key objective of this is to get positive real interest rates at a, at a level that's slightly, slightly deflationary, slightly breaking the economy so that we don't break through full employment, but able to nonetheless support growth at full employment with price stability. And that yeah. means that we have to be around 5% everywhere because we've got two, two and a half percent inflation targets everywhere. So I think we're seeing the three central banks, the three big central banks edging toward 5% nominal policy rates or thereabouts, maybe a little bit above. And that's why we're continuing to see rate hikes in the UK, even though they forecast inflation getting back to target in Europe, even though they forecast inflation getting back to target at current rates. This all sounds like it makes sense. It's logical. And one thing the past three years has done is inject such incredible humility for all of us in the unplanned and the unseen events that come and torpedo all of the nicely planned theories. As we sit out here with the growing uncertainty of what the resolution will be with uh, Ukraine and the ongoing turmoil within Russia, how will that potentially shake your current estimation of what's going to happen? Well, Lisa, what we learned this weekend is we don't have a clue about what can happen next in Russia or Ukraine, for that matter. So um, uh, that's, you know, uh, um, uh, that we can only speculate. Uh, I can invent a dozen scenarios for you, but none of them has more than about a 1 or 2 percent probability. So we just have to admit that we don't know how Ukraine's going to work out and how that's going to affect the world. I mean, consider the possible ramifications of what could have happened this weekend, right? A political disarray in the Soviet Union, taking the third largest producer of crude oil in the world off the market taking a large a dominant producer in major commodities off the market. Uh, these are events that on just on the economic side, uh, you know, could shake up the world economy substantially. We could see a surge in commodity prices. I can make up scenarios like that, but I can't have any confidence in them. Uh, Carl, I've got to spend some time on China here. Your China note, I actually read it the other day, every word of it. Uh, just the trend here out of China, what is the misreporting or misanalysis we should focus on with China right now? Well, Tom, I think that uh, <clears throat> that China believes at the senior level, all right, they, they don't want to make total nice nice with the United States right now, but they do see more benefit 
to a peaceful coexistence than to a new Cold War or increased competition. And I think the way that they received Secretary Blinken was very indicative of their intentions. And a lot of good stuff uh, came out of that. Uh, we did have the slip of the tongue by President Biden, which set things back a little bit. But if you read the op-ed in the People's Daily, they just breezed over that and got right back to the juicy stuff about uh, how Blinken's visit opens the door for exchanges between the two countries and how that can only be good. So uh, I'm hoping for a little bit of detente, if you will, in the uh, battle between the two economies. Uh, I can't promise that uh, any U.S. administration from either party is going to be more friendly to China. <laughs> But I think that we're going to see the Chinese try to de-escalate things a notch or two so that the world can get back to business. They need to have growth through trade. And their trade with the United States has actually declined. Gross exports plus imports has actually been coming down. And they probably miss those exports. And as growth starts to fall short of their desired trajectory, they're going to want to do more and more of it. Carl, we got to cut you short. You've been way too optimistic. Lisa and I are just not used to this. Carl Weinberg, legendary, high-frequency uh, economics. I have never heard Dr. Weinberg that optimistic. He said the last time was in the years. 1960s. <clears throat> I have never heard it. He has been so right about some of the shocks uh, internationally, and particularly 07, 08, 09, and, and all that. And <clears throat> you know, I think we've got to stop here and, and, and just suggest that – Boy, is there a tension out there between people cautious on the markets and people like Carl Weinberg saying, I'm sorry, this is going to work out. Well, if We're going to move on to some form of prosperity. If you look at the details, if you look at a full labor market, aside from concerns that this might prompt central bankers to be more hawkish, that's a good thing, isn't it? Don't we want people to have jobs and to be getting wage increases and be able to have, uh, you know, consumer <clears throat> spending and be able to pay down debts that aren't as big as they used to be? This is a good thing. Right. And this is what I, I he's talking so. about. So, I mean, did you have any Fed speakers in your brief this morning? I guess we were sort of Russia centric. So they're Fed speakers <clears> later <throat> in the week. And really, it is going to be focused on what happens with Wednesday, given the fact that we are going to see ECB President Christine Lagarde. We're going to hear from Jay Powell. We're going to hear from Andrew Bailey. We're also going to hear from the new central banker, Ueda, of the Bank of Japan, all of them on the stage together at a time when they're kind of starting to splinter a little bit about the need to either double down yeah, or perhaps uh, take uh, take a bit beat back. The dollar yen 143.04 is certainly buttressed up there. Maybe not a big deal, but anything weaker through 146 would be a, a huge deal. The euro, of course, that's all that's going on stable. <clears throat> 109.05, and, and Lisa, I think we can say, as is, is we call it, Tina Fordham, I think, really colored it well, given these immense tensions that are out there. The markets have been pretty stable, ruble weaker, but you'd expect that. This is really, to me, the biggest question, why there hasn't been more action. The fact that there hasn't means that no one in markets want to be, make any conclusion whatsoever, which turns to this question, do you go to what you don't know and game out the probabilities of different scenarios, or do you look at what you do know? This is sort of the Carl Weinberg point, and what you do know is that things look pretty good, and it could be the first time in a long time that policymakers are able to achieve a goal with disinflation. Actually, uh, what he thinks is taking inflation back to that 2% target, possibly even within the next year or so. Yeah, we'll have to see. Let's bring it back to the story in Russia and the latest headlines that you have. Bloomberg leading uh, with our team. Putin faces historic threat to absolute grip on power. It's sort of, I, I can't gauge out what not absolute grip looks like, but, you know, I get the point from Bloomberg. The perversity of this all. <clears throat> on one hand, there was a cheer with Prigozhin possibly there was. Marching on well said. Moscow. Yeah. And you saw the videos of Ukrainian leaders eating popcorn and watching this. They were pretty excited about it. But Prigozhin's no saint himself. I mean, he's been pretty brutal in terms of some of the areas he's taken over. There's a question, which is worse, right? Who do we want to be a leader? And if you don't have a leader at the helm of a major nuclear power, that's also concern with nuclear proliferation and a whole host of other things. These are some of the issues <clears throat> that some of the uh, the key intelligence uh, agents of the U.S. are watching the right telegraph now. telegraph comes over to the FT. He is saying Prigozhin still under investigation for mutiny. That, to me, is the sort of the Monday morning headline. Is I mean, we don't know, was, but there it is, still under investigation. And this is my shocked face. <clears throat> I mean, how could he get yeah. off without anything? What does that mean for Putin? I, and the back and forth doesn't really speak well either. We will not speculate. We'll do what Bloomberg Surveillance does. We will speak to experts in the 8 o'clock hour. Ian Bremmer will join us from Eurasia Group. He was fabulous over the weekend with perspective on these historic events in Russia. Good morning.
I believe that uh, the short term is an issue uh, in Europe and in the US because we have to work our way through the inflation problem uh, without causing a deep recession. Uh, but in the medium term, if you think two years ahead, uh, there's nothing but good news. You've seen the major technological innovation that is going to increase productivity. Uh, uh, and I would expect that if we were sitting here again three years from now, uh, uh, everything would look an awfully lot better than it is today. He is David Fokert Landau. To say he's chief economist at Deutsche Bank barely describes his academic research, particularly on flows of capital, particularly this interesting relationship between China and the West. And we see it this morning in dollar and minbi, uh, the yuan I, plunging out 2.6 standard deviations. Edge of plunging, maybe is how I would put it, 7.23 on yuan. It went through 7. That was a big deal. 7.15 was a target for many. And I don't know how you readapt, reassess here at 7.23. At least another indicator there of global slowdown besides a weakness in China is Brent crude 74.23, fractionally higher. West Texas Intermediate still can't get above 70, which frankly surprises me, 69. 44. To me, the stasis that you just uh, sort of <clears throat> laid out, the confusing churn, highlights just how many push-pull factors there are right now. On one hand, China's slowing economy, sending its currency lower, even after it tried to set the peg at a stronger-than-expected level. And then on the flip side, this question around oil, what are the consequences of a conflict that continues to percolate in the region, in Russia, in Ukraine, at a time when Russia is still shipping a lot of barrels of oil well, onto, <clears throat> the, uh, onto the field? And, and just one of the strands of speculation, not reporting is, as you mentioned earlier, the heritage of Wagner in Africa, in Syria, in places. Do they remain, and in what way do they remain in Ukraine? I mean, it's not a conversation for now. But that's got to be a huge uncertainty, or at least unknown, I should say. When I was reading all the notes over the weekend, <clears throat> every single one of them keyed in on commodities, whether it was natural gas or whether it was crude or whether it was wheat. And one person who does track all of it out of the realm of speculation into fact is Will Kennedy of Bloomberg News, who joins us uh, now, senior executive editor for Energy and Commodities. Will, what are you watching after the events of the weekend and the turmoil and questions around what this means for commodity prices? Well, if we take oil, obviously turmoil in the heart of the Russian uh, state is uh, something the oil market needs to be aware of. Uh, Russia produces more than 10 million barrels a day, one in 10 uh, barrels globally, and it exports 80 percent of that. Um, but one of the important facts, I think, since Russia invaded Ukraine is uh, after a blip in the immediate aftermath, that oil has continued to find its way into global markets. Russia is getting its barrels to global markets. It needs the money to finance its war effort. Um, and as long as the state uh, remains coherent, there's every reason to think that Russia will continue to see those barrels flow. And I think that's why, despite the clearly heightened geopolitical risk around Russia after this weekend's event, the oil market has taken it in its stride. Because as you said at the beginning, Lisa, there is plenty of oil supply globally. That's one of the factors feeding into today's market. And in the short term, at least, there's no reason to think that that's going to change. We've had some time since the war started, unfortunately. It's been more than a year, and there's been a big discussion around resilience and energy independence. How much progress has been made on that level and potentially removing some of the geopolitical risk in this sphere when it comes to particularly oil prices? That's right. I mean, there was a huge concern that the flow would stop and that would hit uh, those countries <clears throat> in Europe, especially they were very reliant on Russian hydrocarbons. But the, the oil market has pursued and the wider energy market has proved itself to be incredibly flexible, incredibly resilient, uh, partly because of the way that policy has been constructed to try and <clears throat> limit the price that Russia gets rather than the flow of barrels. Those barrels have been yeah. redirected to India, and that's actually happened remarkably quickly and remarkably effectively. Right. Uh, well, an unfair question, but you're so briefed on this. I'm just going to take advantage of your encyclopedic knowledge. I believe we found over the weekend a huge amount of cash from the Wagner Group, which I assume was paid for by Russian oil. I mean, the amount of cash shown, folks, was almost as large as the advance Javier Bloss got for his wonderful book, <laughs> The World for Sale, the movie rights for that. But seriously, it's like millions and millions of dollars of cash. Did that come from barrels of Russian oil, Will? I have no idea, Tom. I have no idea. I mean, but one thing that we do know about Wagner, which you mentioned earlier, is that it does have a role overseas. And I think one country that people have a uh, 
interested in right now is Libya, where Wagner plays a, a, a big role and has been a factor in the oil industry, uh, keeping uh, oil out of that country. Uh, that's been very volatile uh, oil exports from Libya. And that, I think, as we track the fallout from these momentous events, that's another country you might want to keep half an eye on. How does Turkey play into this? I mean, clearly Turkey's not an oil power. Maybe it's not off your radar, but I saw Lira print 26 today. Erdogan making comments as well. It's a commodity nexus. Where does Turkey fit in at the Bosphorus Strait? Well, the Black Sea is incredibly important here. Obviously, a lot of the events that we saw over the weekend unfolded in the southern <laughs> Russia, uh, Rostov, and uh, that is at the heart of the wheat industry, the agriculture industry in Russia in particular. Uh, grains out of the Black Sea is very important. Clearly, Turkey has been very important in brokering the continued flow of grains from Ukraine. Um, and a lot of Russian oil comes out of the Black Sea. So while things remain calm, it is an area of focus if we were to see more chaos in Russia in the future. That Black Sea area, where obviously Turkey is a central player, as you say, Tom, is incredibly important both for the flow of grains and oil out of the Russian Federation. It's interesting to, to ask about the resilience and what's been uh, transpiring over the past couple of years to offset any potential interruption. And I want to go back to that point because there was uh, this AAA survey put out overnight talking about how we've seen this in the U.S., that even though we're going to see a record amount of demand for travel that is used to be fossil fuel intensive, it's going to be less consumption of gasoline than in the past. Do we have a sense of how much electric vehicles and other types of renewable energies will offset, again, any kind of potential uh, influence from what's going on in the turmoil? Uh, it's a very, very interesting question. I don't think we know all the answers uh, yet, Lisa, and it, it is at the margins. I would say in the U.S., EVs have a much lower penetration than some other parts of the world, Europe and especially China. But one trend that we do see in the U.S. is that, uh, on the whole, many vehicles are becoming a little bit more fuel efficient. Uh, so the amount of gasoline you need for each average mile has tended to trend gently downwards, and that's feeding through to the AAA estimates that you, you see. I think in China, where we're seeing really quite a lot of penetration of electric vehicles, there's a very interesting discussion about how uh, a resumption of economic growth in China, which is obviously weaker than people would like, how energy intensive economic growth is, and how, as the economy grows, as people drive more, how much that truly feeds through into oil mm. demand. And I think there are some indications that that equation is starting to alter because of the EV penetration mm. in Asia. Terrific brief. Will Kennedy, thank you so much. Will Kennedy, our executive editor, driving all of our hydrocarbon uh, coverage here uh, with uh, West Texas Intermediate 6948, Brent crude 7426. Uh, I want to go over the bond market right now with Lisa. We're a bit off our radar uh, this morning with all the news that we're seeing from Russia and speculation, I should point out, uh, as well. And to me, the telling thing, Lisa, is I've got further curve inversion out to negative 102, as Lizanne Saunders just mentioned on Twitter, not out to the March maximum inversion that we've seen. But, boy, are we getting there quickly. But at the same time, the 10-year real yield has come in, and that's something new. We went from a 1.54 into a 10-year tip, 1.47. And it's new now to see further inversion with a lesser inflation metric. People are gaming out a real <clears throat> slowdown how much is this on the heels of what we saw over in Germany, right? The business outlook deteriorated to the lowest seen in a year. We saw that with the IFO Institute uh, gauge falling significantly in the month of June. Is this coloring people's view that perhaps we are going to see in the data an ongoing slowdown, and that's reflected in the yield curve uh, becoming more inverted, <clears throat> and also a lesser real yield? That said, are we just flipping and flopping from the euphoria of the first six months? Now people are kind of retracing a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. I've got some euphoria out there. I mean, Carl Weinberg's killing me uh, with his optimism. I think we've heard it from some other people uh, as well. I'm fascinated to see what Michael Darda says. I would point out the Bloomberg Total Return Index. This is aggregating in a U.S. total return. It's one of about eight indexes that we have. It's in an indeterminate pennant formation right now. I really don't have a break of price up, yield down or price down, yield up. I just within the noise of your world, I don't have a break yet. So an indeterminate pennant formation. <clears throat> it sounds like something that you'd find at Tiffany's. You sit with a book on your lap. Yeah, it is actually. Pendant, pendant you sit formation. With a, it's a pendant. 
It's Schlumberger. Uh, let's not go there. Uh, it's it's like you sit with a you look at chart formations. You know, it's like it's like white smoke coming out of the astrology. Tower. It's like astrology. Better said. <laughs> Futures negative six. Mark Anderson, UBS Global Wealth, coming up. Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning. Both consumers and companies have been more resilient than really the consensus expected. That wall of money is out there spending, and particularly on services. We think that these recession headwinds are going to catch up with us. The bigger risk is that the Fed loses its resolve in the face of this weakness and allows inflation to become entrenched. We're probably at one of those precipices right now where we're peaking in optimism. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen. John Farrell on assignment here on a Monday, and truly an historic Monday for all within international relations after the shock of the weekend. To bring you up to date would take 30 minutes. We've got 30 uh, seconds right now. And the uncertainties this morning, Lisa, on Russia seem to center around where are the people and are allegations and speculations over the weekend still in play? We don't know. And how do you play the crosswinds that leave us in sort of a push-pull, perhaps stagnant, in the same place of uncertainty? Do you look at the now, as Carl Weinberg was saying, which leaves him the most optimistic since the uh, 1960, or do you look at the potential uh, iterations of how this transpires? Just to give you a state of play, if you're just joining us right now, we are hearing that Prigozhin, who does head the Wagner Group, may or may not have immunity in Belarus after uh, attempting to march on Moscow what this means, we just don't know, Tom. Well, we don't know, and it's as simple as that. We're going to keep briefed here uh, with experts here on the international relations, the complexities of it as well, and also what Bloomberg News uh, is uh, reporting. Uh, the basic idea here of mutiny, not coup, which is, I agree with everyone, is just the absolute wrong word to use. Maybe it's what we use in the fervor of Saturday. But on what I guess is a mutiny or an insurrection, is this gentleman from Wagner still under investigation? To me, that's the, the one kernel we can grab onto this morning. Here's what we don't know. Maybe that's <clears throat> going to be helpful to give you a sense. We don't know what his motivation was when he marched on, on Moscow, which is a reason why you can't say a coup, a mutiny perhaps because he was questioning Vladimir Putin's authority. He has been a vocal opponent of some of the tactics that Vladimir Putin has used, as well as the rationale for the war in Ukraine. He hasn't been prosecuted perhaps because Putin needed him and now what? And how is Vladimir Putin trying to navigate his allies that are concerned about a weakening power? Uh, I mean, we're going to have to see here. And part of it is we're, we're doing this wrapped around uh, economic slowdown. We see the slowdown continue this morning. I mean, Lisa, uh, the 10-year yield in five solid basis points. Remember, we were on the 4% watch, sort of, kind of like, I'm exaggerating, 3.68%. People are gaming out what it means. First of all, we did get that data that was disappointing with respect to sentiment in Germany. We are expecting to get ongoing signs of the manufacturing recession in the U.S. Things are slowing down. How do you game that out with hawkish rhetoric that we heard last week from central bankers with Sintra and they're very much at forefront? This is Wednesday's a big day. Wednesday's a big day where you get uh, the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, Jay Powell of the Federal Reserve, as well as Andrew Bailey of the Bank of England. Is it is is Sintra pre-Jackson Hole? Yeah. Or is Jackson Hole post Sintra? This is a philosophical <laughs> question. Deep thoughts by Tom. If we don't do Fed speak, we'll just do, you know, wither, <laughs> wither big central banking hobnobbing. I, there's a, you know, honestly, these are the seminal speeches. And how different is it now versus yeah. August, late August, with the, after the data yeah. that we get? And that's when we get Jackson. My Hall. observation is Francine Lacroix is going to get a lot better food at Centre than Chip Beef on Toast and the Pioneer Grill at Jackson Hall. Let me get through the data check here uh, before uh, Lisa's brief. It's real simple. Bitcoin's done nothing for us. We have to have the Bitcoin quote uh, for Katie Greifeld. Uh, futures negative eight. Now futures negative 25. As we mentioned, yields are in. Two-year yield in four basis points. Even the 30-year in here on global slowdown. Curve inversion, negative 102 basis points is stark. Oil under 70 on West Texas Intermediate, 69.29. And currencies a jumble. Yes, ruble weaker back, I believe, 15 
uh, months is expected, but others, um, I'm going to call it Euro Resilience 10905. People gaming out the unknowns and saying we can't really settle with the unknowns and we'll stick with the knowns. This morning we'll deal with the knowns and we'll deal with the facts and the real knowledge of a host of wonderful guests, including retired <coughs> Lieutenant General David Tula, currently a member of the board at Academy Securities. That's going to be at 7.45. 8.15 a.m., Ian Bremer of the Eurasia Group. Later on Bloomberg uh, TV, we've got Lieutenant General Ben Hodges as well as Alina Polyakova from the Center for European Policy Analysis, who all will be very much well-versed and better-versed on this than us. 10.30 a.m., the latest with respect to the manufacturing recession, U.S. Dallas Fed manufacturing activity comes out, which could be important because it has been indicating recession despite all of the resilience that even Carl Weinberg was saying is leaving him the most optimistic since the 1960s. And at 1.30 p.m., kicking off the Sintra Jackson Hole preview, or perhaps the Sintra taking the steam out of Jackson Hole. ECB President Christine Lagarde giving opening remarks on at the ECB Forum on Central Banking opening reception and dinner over there in Portugal, Tom. We've got lots coming up here. Maria today on Brussels, Amory Horton in Washington uh, will be with us in about 10 minutes. Right now, we'll consider what to do forward, less away from international relations and much more about your portfolio. Mark Anderson joins co-head of Global Asset Allocation, UBS Global Wealth uh, Management. Mark, I thought your note was exceptionally interesting of looking for a lower, uh, a lower rate of return on equity. And what I find interesting is a search for durable income. Describe what durable income is. So first and foremost, I think we find ourselves a bit in a camp where we think that economic activity is likely to slow into the second half of the year. So a bit like you mentioned before, we have yields on both treasuries, sort of the safer haven investments out there, they're coming down, <coughs> meaning the prices are going up. But we cannot be too safely only in our portfolio. So we're looking for durable income in equity markets that are trading a bit more attractive than U.S. markets, where we have an attractive dividend yield. We are looking for yield in emerging market currencies as well as issued in U.S. dollars, where we find that current yields of around 8 9% is something which is very attractive to add to a portfolio at this point in time. I, I look at the portfolio, and it seems like you're distant from 60-40. What is your equity allocation? In a balanced portfolio, we are slightly below 50%. And I think we find that the value of diversification has certainly gone up quite tremendously. And I think with the latest developments in Russia, it's a grave reminder that geopolitical risk is there. We have to think about diversification both in risk scenarios, but I think equally in a world where inflation might be staying sticky. It's something that will be a theme continuously, obviously, but I think with the risk for commodity prices to move upwards on one hand side, for central banks might to preliminarily <clears throat> having pause, in, at least in the US, we need to find some of these diversification in the portfolio, which can come through oil, gold. We're thinking about hedge funds as well. So we do have something that's quite different from the traditional 60-40 portfolio, Tom. Diversification has a very unclear meaning at a time of odd correlations. Are big tech stocks in the United States acting as an equal kind of hedge against geopolitical risk as treasuries? Is that a safe haven for you? Or are you looking at equities being inversely correlated to bonds once again the way that they used to be? So first of all, on AI, so I think the way we like to think about diversification is something that for, first and foremost we can see in correlations through in historical analysis, but equally through our scenario analysis as well. And I think the one concern we would have around something like AI, which is certainly a great long-term diversifier, we have many of our so-called long-term investment themes that are tilted towards AI developments. However, in the shorter term, we're looking for diversification of something that works well both in our base case and more of a risk scenario as well, where not only would inflation stay, stay sticky, but we might get a bit more of a deep recession, which is something that people are, are questioning at the moment. And here's something like uh, a yen that you have debated earlier is a safe haven currency that is very attractively valued, very oppositely to something like some of the AI-related stocks, which might be a diversifier for the very long term. I would only agree, Lisa, but in many ways uh, is very, very expensive valued, at least on most of our metric, and therefore, in a downturn, we'd expect to be selling off as well. How have you shifted allocations and shifted your views as we head to the second half of a year that has defied all expectations? So I'd say the, the one thing that has certainly defied some of our expectation is that the global economy has held up a lot better in this first half of the year. Inflation has as well. As you noted just before, we're starting to see not only manufacturing PMIs, but some of the service ones 
as well. Let's not forget that ISM non-manufacturing <clears throat> came in at around 50 uh, last month. We're going to get the latest reading out very, very shortly. And I think we're likely to get a confirmation that the economy will be will be slowing. So those are some of the signs that we take into account when we're trying to construct our portfolios where we've become mm -hmm. a little bit less optimistic on equities and U.S., uh, in particular, more centered towards fixed income investment at this stage. Mark, help me with your commodity call, and particularly on oil. The $100 barrel crew is in retreat. Where is UBS? So we're thinking that end of the year, we could get Brent around $90 a, a barrel. And I, I think it plays into, there's a lot of interesting dilemmas here going on, because on one hand side, you would say a slowing economic, uh, a, a slowing global economy would tend to suggest that demand for oil would be going down. On the other hand side, we see a very, very rapid supply response from OPEC whenever prices are falling down. I think that's adding a little bit of a cap. Then on top of it, we have very limited risk premium in the market at the moment around Russia. We know that strategic reserves are very low at this point in time. So we suggest that any fall in oil prices would lead to a bit more of a buildup of some of these inventories. Uh, implied volatility is very high. So one thing that we're doing for our global investors is buying uh, put options on oil, so basically selling volatility as a way of generating income. And it goes a bit to the durable income point that you mentioned uh, here before as well, Tom. <clears throat> Mark Anderson, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it this morning uh, with UBS. I, uh, literally, there was one point last week, Lisa, where all this allocations talk and bull bear, bad news, you know, you and John make the joke about good, bad news or whatever you say. There was a point last week, folks, I'm not kidding, my head was spinning. I mean, it was literally, I, I rarely say that. And there I was with my head spinning. You're not alone. I think a lot of people feel that way. There's a, just an utter confusion. If you think about just what even transpired over the weekend, the potential tail risks could be either positive for commodities or negative commodities. The potential tail risks could be incredibly positive for risk assets or highly negative. And so that's the reason why perhaps this churn that you're seeing in markets represents <clears throat> the spinningness well, of everybody's heads. The spinning of it, to me, goes back to oil and the great uncall. Good morning, Edward Moore Citigroup, for just being way out front on the geopolitics of a lesser uh, demand. 69.44 on uh, uh, West Texas, Brent crude 74. 22 this morning. I should point out gold up $12 uh, this morning, 1942 on uh, uh, gold. In the equity market, uh, you know, NASDAQ down a little bit more. The VIX goes out of stick, 14.49. And the Standard & Poor's 500 is down two tenths of a percent. The quiet and the confusion, the head spinningness of markets has left a question around the leadership and, and honestly, the employment at a number of big banks. This is just coming out from Sardar Nadarajan and Catherine Doherty. The Goldman Sachs is planning to add Tom Montag, formerly of Bank of America, to their board, Tom. A really interesting move at a time when they're cutting managing directors and facing a lot of turmoil. This is a really, really interesting New York story. For those of you worldwide, and I don't think it is incorrect to say in the complete total chaos of the mating of Merrill and Bank of America, Montag from Goldman Sachs showing up three cups of coffee before the financial crisis, and what Ken Lewis wrought, this was Moynihan's guy. I think it's it's not off the mark to say this guy single-handedly saved the bank with great respect to Brian Moynihan. Is this David Solomon trying to shore up his leadership <clears throat> at Absolutely. Tax? Absolutely. This is a huge deal. I, I'm not expert in, in the cultural nuances here of the ex-Goldman partner going back to the mothership, given all that's been written about in the last three or four days on Goldman Sachs, but but I wouldn't underplay this. For those of you globally, in New York, Montag back to Goldman Sachs is a huge deal. And I love what you flagged earlier this <clears throat> morning, Montag known for keeping a spreadsheet during the pandemic of people who worked from home and people who oh, were this, in the uh, office. Can I say, <laughs> Brad Qantas, can I say he's a hard ass? Is, can you say that on radio? <laughs> I think you just did, darling. I don't know. <laughs> yes, well, that seems oh, like he's he definitely. Is old school. He is Shrinar old Rajan school. will have a lot of on that. Please stay with us. Futures next. Oh, I'm in the. Uh, someone from Sparta emailing in. I am in the timeout chair. Futures at negative six. Dow futures at negative 16. We will consider Russia in moments. This is Bloomberg.
this really does hurt, hurt Putin, um, and not only just politically and in his, his leadership in Russia and, and his presidency, but in his efforts to uh, continue the war in Ukraine. Putin himself went on national TV to respond to Prigozhin, and Prigozhin said that, that your government has lied to you. This is not a war that NATO started. There are no Nazis in Ukraine. Taking down the very premise makes it much more difficult for Putin to continue to turn to the Russian people and say we should continue to send people to die in this war that for which Prigozhin himself has said to the, the Russian people the premise is, is a lie. Mike Turner, he was with CBS's Face the Nation there, Margaret Brennan here, the chair of the House Financial, in, excuse me, Intelligence Committee, House Intelligence Committee. He's the former mayor of Dayton, Ohio, among other things, uh, commenting in there on the moment. What's interesting, Lisa, is Sunday morning, let's call it 10 a.m. on Face the Nation, seems ages ago. <laughs> You know, to be fair to to uh, Chairman Turner, things have changed. Things have changed, and the <clears throat> uncertainties have only grown. Perhaps time has gone on, and maybe there are more details that we're aware of, and yet that only raises more questions about what exactly the nature of Prigozhin's march to Moscow was, how much this weakens Vladimir Putin's power, <clears throat> who potentially is advising who, who is backing who, what the potential ramifications are uh, in terms mm -hmm. of the war in Ukraine. All of these uh, are not necessarily resolved yeah. in any way, shape or form, at least in the public eye. Right now, we're going to canvas from Washington to London to Brussels. Amory Horton with us, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. Entirely over the weekend, Maria today on Brussels has tried to coalesce all the different tones. Maria, I haven't asked this yet. If this guy goes to Belarus, what will the greeting be like north of Ukraine? And it's a very good question because we don't know the terms of that deal that Alexander Lukashenko, who, remember, he is the president of Belarus, although the international community says he rigged uh, the election and they do not consider him the actual president of Belarus, but he is very closely connected to Vladimir Putin. The only reason why Lukashenko is still in power is because Vladimir Putin supported him in 2020. So I presume that Lukashenko right. will treat Prigozhin in the way that Vladimir Putin asks him to. So within all your reporting, the linkage of Moscow and Belarus is still intact. Putin and Lukashenko is still a relationship. It's one of the foundational things we can believe in in this uncertainty. Are they friends? No. Do they trust each other? Probably not. Do they need each other? Yes. Is this a transactional relationship? Absolutely yes. But for the time being, it works uh, for both. And now we're also seeing that Russia has decided to send the tactical nuclear weapons uh, to Belarus. But again, the question is, in terms of this deal that allegedly Lukashenko cut, what are they? And now we see today, this morning, that the Russians are seeing not so fast this idea that Prigozhin has amnesty. It's actually not correct. The investigation continues. So you could argue even the life of Prigozhin is not clear that he will either make it to Belarus and that he will be treated well there. And Marie, from the U.S. perspective, do they like Prigozhin? Do they think that it was good for him to gain power? Or are they watching this with trepidation on both sides? Perhaps this makes it better for Ukraine or makes the odds better for Ukraine winning if it does weaken Vladimir Putin. But are they about to align themselves with Prigozhin? Well, I think what you heard from Secretary of State Antony Blinken, his remarks over the weekend, one of them was that there are just still so many unknowns and a lot of questions, and this is not the end of the story. To Maria's point, we don't know the details of this deal that Putin struck with Prigozhin, and we don't really know exactly how this is going to end. Remember, the investigation into Evgeny Prigozhin is still ongoing in Moscow, even though he was allowed to leave to go to Belarus. Um, Yevgeny Prigozhin is not an individual that is liked by the United States of America. This is a warlord. This is an ex-convict. This is someone who has, um, has bloodshed on his hands from Africa to Syria to Ukraine throughout the years. Um, someone quipped to me that this is Putin's Frankenstein. This is a monster that he created that then it got out of hand. Many do not think that Yevgeny Prigozhin was trying to or orchestrate a coup. A coup. This was mutiny. Uh, and he has been ignored for weeks, for months, by Vladimir Putin, and he was trying to really um, get his point across because he felt like he was not getting the support adequately needed for the Wagner troops from the Russian military. And Marie, 
We have a lot of questions. There are a lot of unknowns. Do we have a sense, then, of how important this is, given that some people are saying this is the biggest revolutionary kind of act going back to 1917, and other people saying, we just have no clue what this is. We don't know how to categorize this, and we don't even understand whether this weakens Vladimir Putin significantly. So there's one individual I really would point to over the weekend in their analysis of what went on internally in Russian uh, in Russia, and that was Tatiana Stanoiva. And this is what she she said. She she had previously vo vo voiced that this was a powerful blow that has been dealt to Putin and the state, and this will seriously affect the regime. But. She said, I want to point out that the issue of image for Putin has always been secondary. So yes, optically, this is a massive blow for Putin. You had Evgeny Prigozhin with tanks, with military uh, weaponry, with his troops, uh, two to three hours away from Moscow city center. At the same time, Putin, as we've seen in years in the past, if you've covered him or been in Russia, when there are individuals and cracks, he gets in at the very last minute and he secures it with a deal. That is what he did here. Right. So it shows that he still has massive amounts of power, but obviously there are cracks. Uh, Maria, help us in our ignorance, uh, and there's been some good articles on this in the last 48 hours, of a given ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile, pointed west somewhere in the eastern, uh, in the far uh, Western Russia sphere. I mean, are those missiles like right over the border? And should we be as concerned about them as some people speculate? Uh, but look, Tom, I think when it comes to Russia, that was, uh, again, speculation yesterday about what should we do with the nuclear weapons and how to respond and all of this escalation. Every Eastern European leader that I reached out to and, and officials in the eastern flank actually said this whole situation is good for Eastern Europe because it means they will get more troops. And, in fact, today Germany announced that they're sending more to Lithuania. The Eastern Europeans also say at this point, whenever there are situations like this, Russia likes to bring up the idea of nuclear concerns because it thinks it will scare them. But overall, and I would point to the words of the Polish <clears throat> president, Duda, what they right. say is that, if anything, this was an embarrassment for Russia and the situation internally has de-escalated. The one thing I would point very quickly, I did speak to a very good contact in Ukraine and I asked, is this good or bad news? And this person told me it is very good news. It shows once again that Russia is not invincible, but also this myth of the KGB men, to some extent, well, it's a myth. Maria Tadeo, thank you so much. Amory Horton, thank you so much. Amory Horton with Balance of Power tonight, and they'll have an update here and, of course, on the delicate discussion on uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, Putin here, this is a quote, I believe, from uh, Reuters, Mr. Putin calling them invincible weapons as part of the fear. I'm uneducated on this, and the answer is I think i got to get more briefed on this, to say the least. A lot of people were talking over the weekend <clears throat> that geopolitical leaders wouldn't be that concerned about this if it weren't for the nuclear weapon yeah. question. Yeah. And a vacuum of power in Moscow is a real problem, not just because there is a question over who takes the role, but this question over what happens to nuclear weapons, which is only second to the U.S. in terms of its size. That's the big concern in terms of unstable leadership over in Moscow, even if it does benefit Ukraine <clears throat> in the short run. We'll have to see. The futures here are pretty much stasis. Do you agree with me on that, Lisa? I mean, it's just sort of just like, you know, we opened and there's an opening statement here on where the markets are. And I think we're just waiting for more information. I'm talking within the economic sphere. You mentioned Germany. Uh, statistics showed a, a little bit of weakness, to say the least. Yeah, the weakness in the IFO sentiment survey going back a year. <laughs> and there is going to be an ongoing slew of data, including home builder sentiment and some of the home building stats later this week, as well as sentiment on Friday from the United States, from the University of Michigan. I'm listening. Are we still on the theme that hawkish central banks are going to kill the dynamism of the tech oh. trade and some of the other uh, positive economic trades of the first six months of the year? The, the, the banner here, Apple, you know, this is under the radar. Friday, near record high, 2.936. I think I got the number of zeros right on radio. There's three six, there's eight zeros before all the fancy numbers coming right up on three trillion. <laughs> yeah, Tesla doubles it's terrible. In its valuation. We're all going to die. They're going to go out of business. Futures at negative six. Amy Wu Silverman, RBC Capital Markets next. Good morning.
Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Key. Mr. Farrow is on a continued assignment. He's like on a third island somewhere. I don't know. It was like Hopefully Capri, he's having a good time. Ischia, Ischia, and I can't pronounce the third island, but there he is. He's out there. Futures are uh, doing a little better than they were an hour ago. Futures negative five, Dow futures negative 11. Uh, yields are in, and in sprightly. 10-year uh, yield 3.68%. Two-year yield, 4.70%. There is curve inversion, negative 102. And as I mentioned, probably the one distinguishing feature this morning is the inflation indicator, the tip. The 10-year real yield is 1.48. That was 1.54 uh, before there was mutiny is in that, uh, Russia. Is that what we're calling and, it? Yeah. That's from Stan Freeberg, mutiny, mutiny, mutiny. It's an album from my childhood. We can play it over we the reports, the questions that we rumble, have. Rumble, rumble, rumble. Mutiny, mutiny, mutiny. It wasn't a coup. I think a lot of the news organizations have really been good about that, including Bloomberg, of saying this is this is not a coup. That's what we made up in the heat of Saturday and, and all that. But it's something uh, much more. We'll have more coverage on uh, Russia here coming up. Our team is working tirelessly. You'll see that through uh, the morning and into the afternoon uh, as well. But right now, I think we need to move with movers and we start by saying Tom was wrong. So that's a good way to start. <laughs> well, I mean, just to give a sense of what else is going on outside of the drama spurred inside of Russia, there is going to be a stress test result coming out on Wednesday. The Fed is still very focused on the U.S. financial system. PacWest Bancorp, very much in the news this morning. This looks like a big pop, 7.3 percent gain. Tom will roll his eyes at me. The shares are $7.76 off a peak of $51.20 <clears throat> in January 2021. But this comes after they sold a $3.5 billion asset-backed loan portfolio to Aries Management as they try to bolster liquidity with some of the outflows they've been seeing. We'll get a review <clears throat> of that coming up on on Wednesday. No surprises in the Friday report that we get every week. But I am very closely watching this because, Tom, you asked the question, is the banking crisis over? Yes, maybe. Who knows? We're yeah. still watching. And I think that that's what people have to say. We'll have to see on that. We've got a chart on that here in a bit. What else do you have? Alphabet dropping uh, about 2.3 percent, or Tesla first uh, dropping 2.3 percent after being downgraded to neutral from buy at Goldman Sachs. This comes after the shares have just skyrocketed so far this year. But an increasing number of analysts are coming out and saying we don't know yet what the implications are for both the electric vehicle charging network as well as the competitive edge that they have. And Alphabet falling after UBS downgraded the company to neutral questions around monetization around artificial intelligence and that's it, going to continue it'll to be, be fascinating question. to see the news flow into the summer on tesla i have no idea what to think i think nobody <clears throat> well i yeah. think there is something legitimate under it now valuations are really the focus and again the main question heading into the second half of this year has been can the biggest rally on record for the first six mm -hmm. months of a year in tech stocks persist despite the increasingly hawkish rhetoric mm -hmm. of central banks google what do you have Google is falling 1.4 percent because they were downgraded because of monetization risks for artificial intelligence. Okay, they were downgraded as well. Sorry, I missed that uh, this morning. I was wrong on the banks. Bring up this chart on radio. It's real simple. A lot of us, including me, believe there was actually a rebound in the banks. At least it's like a dead cat bounce. Pack was. I had no idea. They just haven't come back, have they? They have not come back. The peak was uh, $51.20 in January <clears throat> 21. Uh, there is an issue right now with the Bears. Do they double down or do they get perhaps a little bit more optimistic like Carl Weinberg did earlier this morning? Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson among those staying bearish, saying equities are facing a wall of worry, which could fuel a sharp sell-off. Quote, the headwinds significantly outweigh the tailwinds, and we believe risks for a major correction have rarely been higher. Our target for the S&P 500 is 3,900 for 4Q <clears throat> of 2023. Even though, as people have been saying, the underlying economy looks good for now, Tom. Yeah, but there's 3,900, but there's a lot of other people below Mike Wilson. Mike's getting all the print, but there's some serious bears out there uh, who, you know, they're being challenged right now to be polite about it. Yeah, like uh, Greg <clears throat> Buttle over at, uh, yeah. at BNP Paribas. Yeah, absolutely. 43.83 on SPX uh, right now. Someone watching this is Amy Wu Silverman, had a derivative strategy. RBC Capital Markets. I keep my head's spinning, Amy. It's like the fifth cross moment. It's out worse than kurtosis and, and, and the rest of it. Over the weekend, how did you study the bull bear debate? 
Yeah, obviously, you know, incorporated into the weekend was just the geopolitical news. And I will tell you, coming into this weekend, volatility, Tom, had just been pummeled. You know, one thing we were talking about is just when you look at Apple, which is 20% of the contribution of return to the S&P this year, 20%. It's at a two, five, and 10 year low from an options perspective. So, you know, the Birkin of the market is, is on sale. And then on top of that, now you get this geopolitical instability. What does that mean? It's tough, but I just have to say that when you introduce this level of uncertainty, it's hard not to see, you know, option price levels as quite compelling. When you see a lack of volatility of VIX 14.43, we had a 12 print at one point, just as a general amateur statement. How do bulls hedge? Are you able to constructively and effectively hedge your success right now? Yeah, so that's an interesting question because of the following observation. The one thing that's been happening in options right now is volatility and spot price have actually been positively correlated. That's that's not normal. So usually, you know, your VIX goes up when your S&P goes down and vice versa. We've been having VIX and S&P go up at the same time. One of the reasons for this is because of those bulls, Tom, because folks are still reaching for that right tail. They're doing it through options, and that's a function of why you're seeing both volatility and spot price rise in some instances. Amy, how are you tracking the potential terrorists being exploited or, or expressed following this weekend's events? Are you starting to see shifts in how people are putting on tail risk hedges? Yeah, so I think we're going to get more details on that kind of later today, Lisa, just because it happened over the weekend. But I'll tell you, you know, I've been in Boston speaking with clients, and this past week before the news hit, it was just kind of this overall statement of, look, volatility is low, but I think we still need to sell it because low volatility does not necessarily mean cheap volatility. And then over the weekend, you introduced a pretty big left tail risk that I think, you know, possibly could be a compelling reason for folks to own it. So you might see that left tail start to get bit again. We've been talking all morning about one of the biggest questions heading into the second half of the year is whether this tech trade can continue or whether it's going to get retraced substantially based on positioning. What's your read on that? So positioning right now, and, you know, I'll just say granted, given the political news, this might change. But Going into this past weekend, it was still remarkably bullish. So folks were still on that tech train. They were still on that momentum train. And you see that in, you know, that skew inversion, that call demand over the put demand in Apple, in NVIDIA, et cetera. But as I mentioned, you know, you have hedges in Apple costing kind of decade lows. And really the question I think is with this breadth of the market, if tech goes, the market by definition, goes. And so that's what I think people are going to have to start putting into their thought process going forward. What are you recommending then? What are you saying is the more likely outcome based on positioning, based on the bullishness? Does that make the trade more fragile or does that give it legs because of the money still flowing in? Yeah, you know, I, I think, look, when you start to introduce geopolitical risks like what we're seeing, the one thing is the market tends to be very bad at pricing out these risks from a left tail and a right tail perspective. So overall, if you're going to put tail hedges on some sort of index proxy, like an Apple, for instance, those are quite inexpensive because what happens is if it becomes more unstable, you get a correlated move down. That's what we've seen historically. And that's why, you know, you want to just own anything that could be a problem to the overall market. Amy, uh, Lawrence McDonald made a splash, I think it was 10 days ago, with a lengthy, lengthy essay off the first order mass of index funds, ETFs, all the other 401k stuff we do. And then the Amy Wu Silverman space of overlaid derivative instruments on top of this ginormous amount of money. Do we have opacity or clarity on the notional value of the derivative, the set of derivative instruments off of our gazillion dollar retirement base. Yeah, so so this has been a very hot topic, Tom, among derivatives practitioners, because so when you speak to that, the, the way I'll tell you it happens practically is there's now a lot of money going into funds where, you know, the, the fund is essentially long stocks, but there is a derivative overlay strategy that's maybe selling calls, uh, collecting premium on top of it. And so what has happened because of that, Tom, is there has been this dampening of volatility overall, 
because there's so much notional going into funds that's selling volatility into an environment that yeah. already has narrow breadth. And the question is, you know, this is what derivatives practitioners are asking. What happens when this breaks? What happens when there's big correlated move either to the downside or to the upside? In this case, it's actually a correlated move to the upside that could break this because remember it's it's mostly overriding that's where the notional is and i do think that's that's why you know we fixate so much on the breadth of tech because if ai keeps going if that train keeps going that's where i have the question but it does seem like you know right now that maybe some of the froth is slowly starting to leave the market at least from price action this past week Amy, thank you. What a clinic. Amy was Silverman, RBC Capital Markets there. Lisa, this is a huge, huge deal. I just can't say enough about 87. Okay, it happened in the take two days later, we we're all like, oh, portfolio insurance or, you know, 98 or the flash crash, whatever. And as Greenspan articulated beautifully once, we have to have derivative instruments. They're a constructive value to a financial system. But they feed on themselves. And where are we now in the cumulative snowball rolling down the hill of notional top line derivative value? My answer is we don't know. Amy, I thought was a little more articulate about it. We don't know. And there's also this issue of people who are trying to get signals from the derivative exposure. You talk about VIX. That's a key example. VIX artificially suppressed because of how people are expressing some of their views in markets, renting it, not buying it. I mean, we'll just, we'll just, I have to see. And, you know, I, I think it's, the problem is it's very complex. It, the fact is it's complex and people's eyes glaze over. Uh, when they read about this stuff or, or, or listen to it. But the fact is it has to be addressed also on the leverage bet, on what the leverage is out there, the underlying, you know, are we going to get out to 20 to 1 idiocy, which usually <clears throat> gets us in trouble. <laughs> well, this, that's the reason why I think a lot of people are watching <clears throat> the stress tests that come out on Wednesday by the Federal Reserve to understand the leverage being baked into a system that has been made more resilient. If you're just joining the program, you could take a look at the S&P lower by about a tenth of a percent, a bit of a safety trade, 10 year yields uh, lower by about five basis points, 368 uh, right now. I am curious, especially given some of the uncertainty, how some of the biggest banks, Tom's <coughs> are, Tom, are readjusting, given that they're expecting deal flow to drop off. And there's a changing of the guard at a number of banks. Well, it's a change of the guard at a number of banks. But to your point on readjustment, we have yet to mention this. That's how much we're focused on what's going on. And in Russia, and, and Lisa, it's simple. Right sizing at JP Morgan, right sizing at Goldman Sachs, right sizing at City. There's a trend here into the summer wrapped around the world of Shanali Basak around investment banking. That you're going to see deals fall <clears throat> off, trading volumes expected, trading revenues expecting to fall quite significantly just on a year over year com comparison uh, basis because last year was so great. Then this morning, our colleagues over on Bloomberg News are reporting that Tom Montag is joining Goldman Sachs after previously being one of the top executives of Bank of America, possibly bolstering <clears throat> the David Solomon era and someone who is not exactly a soft character or someone to have a small presence. Well, the New York Times, Katie Kelly in the New York Times did a terrific treatment on this two years ago, and it was, a, it was a huge, lengthy story on Tom Montag. And the part of it that I think really captures it and the comfort for Mr. Solomon is, you know, what I, I, did, a, I did a panel at Davos with Tom Montag. He's a throwback. Okay, there's no, you know, he's a guy from another generation. He's gonna, He's going to give a traditional message, perhaps, as a member <laughs> yeah. of the Goldman Sachs board. Traditional message, get Returning. back to the office. That's the <clears throat> well, uh, key question, yeah, right? That's part of it. I was going <laughs> to deal on that. But he's going to say, uh, he'll certainly say his peace of mind is something we all know from Tom Montag. He returns to his Goldman Sachs. Uh, red and green on the screen. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
I think right now they'll just be uh, observant uh, and uh, see what the wider ramifications are. Of course, um, if uh, this is not the end of it, uh, and I think many markets do not think this is going to be the end of it, of course, uh, there will be repercussions and central banks uh, will then react accordingly. But ultimately, it's about demand versus inflation. And again, in the Eurozone, on the continent, and Russia, of course, will play uh, into this. Uh, we are seeing clear signs of a demand slowdown. And I think that's something that needs to be reacted to. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance. Jeffrey, you there getting us started. BNY Mellon here. Lisa and I just scouring all the news sources uh, here on uh, a really original uh, Monday. I, I would say, Lisa, the only idea we can coalesce around here away from speculation is many sources, including Bloomberg, uh, saying the former head of Wagner, I guess, well, like, see, I'm wrong on that. Maybe he's still head of Wagner, still faces charges, says the Russian state media. I'm just quoting from the FT, but many sources have that. The news over the weekend was <clears throat> that along with uh, the right-hand man of Vladimir Putin, the Prigozhin, head of the Wagner group, which has made big inroads in Ukraine, had marched on Moscow been vocal in his opposition against Vladimir Putin and then come to some agreement, maybe, to go to Belarus and not be charged. To understand all of the uncertainties and what this means, how important it may be, even amid all of our myriad questions, we are so lucky to have with us someone who has extensive experience over <clears throat> four decades in the uh, Army, Navy, and currently as a, really a, a teacher at the U.S. Air Force Academy, retired Lieutenant General David Deptula, a board member for Academy securities and someone with a storied history throughout the years in a number of different conflicts. Uh, Lieutenant General, I want to start with how important were the events over the weekend from your vantage point? Well, Tom and Lisa, uh, thanks very much. Uh, first, what I would tell you, um, what we've seen is uh, pretty incredible and uh, incredibly significant. Uh, the Wagner revolt is an opportunity for the Ukrainians on the one hand, from both a military and a psychological warfare perspective, uh, particularly if Wagner's combat-hardened troops remain out of Ukraine, um, that could tip the fight in Ukraine's favor. But there's just so much uncertainty um, regarding just what is happening out there. The, you know, the fact of the matter is that uh, Mr. Putin is still in power. And his priority now is staying in power. Uh, he's seen this as a chink in his armor, if you will. And now he wants to avoid a spark that weakens and turns public opinion against him. Uh, and that has gone into this whole notion of what happened um, over the weekend. Um, uh, but uh, there, there are lots of rumors running around. Uh, there's one that uh, Prigozhin uh, captured a nuclear storage facility in Russia, which would explain his decision to suddenly end the coup, which was proceeding, frankly, quite well. Moscow may never have been his final destination. Uh, the nuclear storage facility might have been. So if, in fact, that happened, which, again, it, it's a rumor, but um, once he got where he was going, he ended the operations because his objectives were achieved. We just don't know. What would be some um, of your key questions, retired Lieutenant General, at a time when a lot of people are talking about how this likely does benefit Ukraine, but raises the uncertainty about the nuclear arsenal, as you just said? Lieutenant General, what are you curious to know? What would you be looking for to get some sort of sense of whether this is positive in terms of ending the conflict or negative in terms of nuclear proliferation? Well, th that excellent questions, um, and the answers are what I'd be looking at. Um, wh where is he? Um, what were his objectives? Um, is he operating out of um, uh, a Belarus now? You know, there's also a possibility that this so-called um, Wagner revolt was a ruse to open up a northern front from Belarus into Ukraine. So. One needs to understand that deception is a fundamental element of Russian right. operations. So there's a lot of speculation, but few facts just yet. And that's what we need to do is hear some of the facts, right. uh, or at least verify some of the facts, and then we'll uh, be better prepared to understand just what's going on. Lieutenant General, an honor to have you with us. And it goes back to Colorado Springs and long before Colorado Springs. 
in Billy Mitchell. Many people have linked you to the heritage of the advent of airplanes in America in military. And David Deptula is clearly associated with drones and all the development we've had in drones. Lieutenant General, do these events in Russia and Belarus, do they allow for a better use of airspace by Ukraine, either aircraft or drones? It's a wonderful question, Tom, and, and I much appreciate it. Uh, first, lesson number one, coming out of what's happened uh, with this Ukrainian-Russian conflict is the value of air superiority, because neither side has it right now. And what air superiority is, is essentially the ability to operate freely in airspace one wants to operate at any time in any location. Without that, what you've seen is this conflict devolved to a World War I-style slugfest right. trench warfare. So uh, that's a huge lesson. Um, uh, and it, 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 I don't want to take a lot of time because I know we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but one has to ask why the Russians perform so poorly with respect right. to using their air forces. It's understandable on the part of the Ukrainians because there's such a small air force relative to the Russians. What's uh, important here, Lieutenant General, is the offense, if you will, given this opportunity, given this chaos, uh, for example, the expansion of the drone system, which basically you invented with full credit to a huge part of our air force, against Crimea or to weaken Crimea or to signal that Ukraine wants to have a greater dominance in the Black Sea over to Crimea. Is this now the opportunity to use drones to free up that geography? Well, that's part of it. But once again, we, you know, a drone's not a drone. That's why some of us <clears throat> prefer the term remotely piloted aircraft. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, because there are small ones, there are large ones, there are ones that have the capacity to carry weapons, to carry other systems that can impose desired effects. A good example is that, uh, is you've seen the small quadcopters, and they do have their role mm -hmm. and value. But if you look at systems like the MQ-9 Reaper, um, that's incredibly capable, and that could accomplish the kinds of things that you're talking about. <clears throat> but we've got uh, 48, 50, 60 of them just sitting in crates here in the United States that could be in the hands of the Ukrainians. But there are policy issues on the part of the United States government that are currently holding those up. And we'd like to free those up okay. and see those get into the hands of the Ukrainians. Thank you for this brief, Lieutenant General uh, David Deptula with us uh, this morning. People go, who's the guy? Like you think of submarines, Hyman Rickover. This is the guy who did drones. Just that simple. And and there's no other way to put it. You ask a good question about the airspace, given that this has been one big question, why the why Russia hasn't used their air yeah. dominance over Ukraine, whether that could change in uh, the wake of some of the developments. We don't know. And I thought he did a great job there talking about some of the questions and some of the potential ramifications. But his conclusion was this does benefit Ukraine and this will make it uh, perhaps give them an advantage in the near term. Uh, a, a better tape, and I wonder if some of this is over the stasis, at least, a news flow out of Russia. We've had, I'm going to suggest, four or five hours of stasis off the total chaos of Saturday uh, here. And I think you see it in the tape. You know, it's, it's all, these are little tweaks. If I don't, I'm not overselling this, but I got red and green on the screen. I've got the VIX not as angsty as it was. There's, I'm trying to help me here. I'm trying to get some glimmers of optimism going. I feel like everyone was sort of <clears throat> getting into vacation mode. It's been a long year. Everyone's really tired. It's getting into a holiday season for the U.S. How dare Russia and do this? And a lot us. of people were hoping for a quiet <laughs> weekend, and then this Ooh. happened, and all of a sudden, everyone had to pay attention to find out whether it was going to bite them in the butt. And this is really the issue right now when we look at whether people care about this. And I think the stasis you're talking about is people are saying, well, if we're not hearing anything for right now, we could just remain on hold and go back to our mid-year assumptions and our uh, and our potential plans for the upcoming six yeah, months. Yeah, we just have to work it out through the, the morning uh, as well. We should point out ruble. There's three ways to look at ruble. It's a little confusing. There's a ruble basket. There's a dollar ruble. There's euro ruble. Uh, Euro rubles has the most angst here this morning, to, uh, weaker seven tenths of a percent Russian ruble, but really back to 15 months weakness uh, after shocking Russia's strength there off the 
beginning of the war in Ukraine. Please stay with us. Coming up next, Colin Martin, Schwab. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. With the Fed and all these other central banks having tightened policies so aggressively, it does start to bite, and it is starting to bite. Fundamentally, actually, the economy is very strong. We are only now getting to tight policy. We're not clearly at the end of the tightening cycle. I think the medium-term view is that we get the recession, and that can drive a deeper drawdown. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. And Russia is the big tail risk once again. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio, on Bloomberg Television. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz, John Farrow, on vacation this week. And we are looking right now at a time, Tom, when once again people are not talking about inflation. They are not talking about central banks. They are saying what's going on in Russia and how significantly could this change the course of events? Or what's going on or not going on. And it's not news. I thought Tina Fordham was great earlier about the counterfactual here about looking at what is not being said. And this morning is a general statement. It seems to be radio silence from all the geographies of certainly Rostov and Don and also Moscow over to Belarus. And frankly, Kiev, I think, has been very quiet, just letting him stew and see what the news flow brings. And the answers in the last three hours, not much. And what we heard over the weekend was the Wagner <laughs> military group that had been working with the uh, Russian military in Ukraine in a number of different conflicts that the leader, Prigozhin, marched on Moscow in some defiance against uh, the, the Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, and we are looking right now at this idea that people are looking at potentially <clears throat> some sort of tail risk because they think things look pretty strong right now and right. still are worried. This out moments ago from the Telegraph in London, Mr. Putin making a video address. I need to be very careful about speech or whatever here. He was speaking to the 11th International Youth Industrial Forum, Engineers of the Future 2023. Lisa, I know you're all over that event. And the answer is he didn't mention anything about the coup. You don't know you know, you don't know the when of this, the taping of this, et cetera, but at least there's some form of recent sighting of Mr. Putin, as reported by The Telegraph. Right. And we don't really understand whether this was <clears throat> some sort of coup, whether this was an, uh, really an issue of just simply expressing displeasure. We don't have a lot of details. What we do know, though, is the fact that markets were so focused on it and there's little reaction in terms of direction to the trade highlights the uncertainty and the well, stasis <clears throat> at a time of great reset heading into a very different second half of the year. Yeah, and on the day to check, it's simple, folks. I'm going to truncate this because there's so much going on. But the tape is better over the last three hours. I think that's the headline for everybody waking up in America and for Global Wall Street. There's an improved tape over the last uh, two and a half hours, I would say. Futures are negative three. Dow futures flat. Actually green on the screen a second ago. The yields are not as grim as they were. We are in five basis points, four basis points. We come in a little better right now. Uh, oil up 61 cents. What can I say? You know, <laughs> It's a bull market we'll for oil. It. There you go. Uh, not quite. We are also seeing natural gas over in Europe rising, although off some of its higher gains as people calibrate what this means in the non-news, as you point out, Tom. The fact that Treasuries rallied to me is fascinating. The fact that you did see a haven play for Treasuries, even though some people were saying that potentially some of the outcomes could be inflationary. And that raises a question uh, as bonds as a diversifying instrument. Colin Martin joining us now, fixed income strategist at the Schwab Center for Financial Research. Colin, did you take a signal from that that once again we have seen bonds reclaim their role as a stabilizing factor and the counter hedge to risk? Yeah, we, we think so. I mean, as you alluded to, we saw yields come down a little bit, although they've given some of that retreat back. But yes, we do think when there are concerns like this, when there are risks like that, you see the bid for treasuries pick up. You, sh you see yields come down a little bit. There is that inflationary theme a little bit in there. Uh, but as Tom alluded to, oil hasn't done too much. And we look at the grand scheme of thing, I don't think that would move the needle too much in, in terms of overall inflation, and especially anything that, that the Fed would be looking at. But to, your, to get to your question, yes, 
they they do offer that diversification benefit, and it's one of the reasons why we've continued to suggest all investors consider bonds at these levels. Colin, uh, if it weren't for the Russia conflict, we would be talking about Cintra. We'd be talking about the fact that the head of the ECB, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, and the Bank of England are all going to be meeting on Wednesday to discuss their increasing fight on inflation. Do you think people are understating or overstating how far these central banks are willing to go, not only in how high rates go, but how long they're willing to hold them there? I'd say understating, both internationally and domestically. Now, we're not expecting a ton more rate hikes from the Fed, but it does seem like one is likely. What we're focusing on is really that length, as you just mentioned. Whether or not they hike once more, twice more, or even more than that, what we're focusing on is the length of time, because I think that's where really tight financial conditions and restrictive policy comes into play. Because it doesn't give households or corporations any type of borrower, it doesn't give you that bailout down the road to then take advantage of lower rates. The longer they hold, the more they can reach their goals, bring inflation down. So we do think the markets are probably under underestimating that, although it has adjusted a little bit, where rate cuts have essentially been pushed back significantly. And you're Danny Pub this weekend, Carl Keaton and over the Death Star mentions it. Thank you, Carl. And it's a basic idea of the wall of money out there. Lawrence Don uh, McDonald 10 days ago said the same thing. There was a wall of money out there. That wall of money is, of course, 99 percent at Schwab. We know it. Is there literally a shortage of bonds? I don't think there's a shortage of bonds. We're not there, to Templeton's <laughs> famous shortage of bonds yet. I don't, I don't think so. Not yet. And there's a lot of money out there. Uh, we talk a lot about you know, pandemic savings, what's there, what's not. I think a lot of that probably is gone, but we're still looking at wages right, right now. We're going to need to see wages come down a little bit. We're going to need to see the loosening of the labor market to really see that spending come down to a level that, that the Fed's more comfortable with. But just on a, on a retirement basis... Are you people optimistic that there will be issuance by corporations in the taxable space, away from full faith and credit? Is there going to be issuance there so we can buy the coupon? Or as John Templeton said iconically uh, for four decades ago, there will be a shortage of bonds. I don't think so. If we look at corporate specifically, the amount outstanding in just the investment <clears throat> grade world, for example, we're looking at you know six trillion plus. That's a lot. I wouldn't expect corporations on mass to suddenly to suddenly start shrinking the amount they have outstanding. I think they'll be cautious in the near term, but we wouldn't expect a shrinking going forward. We look at the big picture in terms of corporate issuance, whether it's loan market, high yield market, you get closer to you know ten plus trillion. I wouldn't expect that to shrink anytime soon. Given the fact that you don't expect a shrinkage, you do expect uh, companies to continue to maintain their leverage profiles, when will higher rates bite? Because they'll have to refinance at some point. Yeah, uh, hopefully soon. We've been thinking it's going to you know, weigh on these corporations for a while now. And, and so far, it hasn't at least impacted the way the markets are perceiving the risk there. We've seen spreads all across the, the rating spectrum come down. We saw a little bit of an uptick last week. We're expecting it to be more pronounced in, in the junk market, but especially the loan market. This is something we've been concerned with. So if you're asking, <clears throat> when will they hit the bottom lines here? It's hitting the bottom lines of loan issuers right now. If you issued loans over the past couple of years, you've seen your interest expense double. Which is the reason why loans have underperformed. And you've seen that in a pretty pronounced way. High yield bonds, though, have continued to rally. And this is the conundrum. If you look around, uh, like what we heard of earlier this show, you th see things as being pretty good. You see employment as being pretty full. How do you sell off in advance of a crisis or some sort of tightening in credit conditions that will inevitably happen at some point when these companies roll over their debt? Yeah, that, that's what we're concerned with. If we look at the outlook, we've seen defaults start to pick up. If you look at Moody's and S&P data, defaults are closer to 3% or so, more than double what they were a year ago. Expectations are for them to rise. I'll go back to my point before about the length of time that rates are so high, where those corporations who might be sitting on the sidelines right now, not looking to refinance or issue debt, they're not going to get really be given that opportunity anytime soon. Now, high yield bonds have performed really well this year. And even though we continue <clears throat> to talk about how cautious we are, spreads remain close to 4%, 4.5% area. We still see plenty of indicators out there that suggest they should move higher. What we're telling our clients, we're not saying you need to get out totally. We are saying we're cautious. We expect spreads to rise. But if you hold for a long mm -hmm. period of time, you can kind of ride out those price declines. And you can see spreads rise 200 basis points or so and still break even or even make money over a 12-month time frame. We always talk about 12 months with our clients because that's you want to really earn those annual income payments. Are, are you expecting new issuance by corporations when these ginormous companies, Apple or whatever, 
they'll you know make four phone calls and sell five kajillion dollars of bonds. But is there going to be a solid issuance stream in taxable bonds? I think for IG, we can see solid issuance. I think they can withstand it. They have stronger profiles to do that. I think we'll see a weaker high yield market. I think investors are going to be a little bit more cautious, and I think issuers themselves are right. going to look at those numbers and, and decide this, this might not make sense for me right now. Colin, thank you so much for joining today. Colin Martin right. with Charles Schwab. Uh, today. Lisa, I think this is a huge deal for CFOs. What do we do? And the answer is maybe a little less equity and a, and a bigger bond exposure. And I don't mean people like auto companies or John Deere, where it's part of their customer financing. I'm talking about vanilla industrials, you know, old school stuff. And they'll get good rates because people are still <clears throat> clamoring for their bonds. You might see lower spreads than pe people have seen in the past because the benchmark yield is so much higher. It is the other companies that I wonder about, the riskier companies with more leverage. Do they go to the public market? Do they start going increasingly to private markets that are becoming much bigger and richer and deeper as people seek opportunities? These are some of the questions that people are gaming out right now, not calling for a wholesale credit <clears throat> crisis, but calling for an increasing sort of boiling of the frog the longer that rates are Where held. Where did this phrase come this from? Boy, a, this is like the third time I've heard this in the last couple of days, boiling of the frog. It's just slowly turning up the temperature more and more and more and more until the frog is no longer with us. Can't we do boiling of a lobster? That just sounds like, <laughs> that just sounds well, like, like no, It's basically the <clears throat> slow grind is what people are talking about. Because at some point, there was a story, that we've been writing extensive stories about why this economy hasn't been as interest rate sensitive as so many people thought that it would be. Yeah, and this there's is the some treatment why. this weekend yeah. on that. Yeah, and this is part of the reason why companies don't have to borrow that I, actually would have to pay the really high rates. Yeah, I, I agree with that strongly, but I'd also say also there's a pandemic study. I do want to point out is part of this pandemic study uh, we'll have full coverage from Sintra with a huge focus on Wednesday right Wednesday yep Wednesday yeah. is going to be the big the big confab <clears throat> with all the central bank focus. heads everyone that's going to be there is going to be there and uh, we'll give you the central bank coverage as they uh, readjust and recalibrate into the summer uh, from uh, Portugal uh, futures at negative three the S&P down fractionally a tenth of a percent Right now, as we uh, recalibrate heading into the second half of the year, I do think a big focus is going to be on the banking sector, Tom, especially given that they kick off earnings uh, about July 14th, I believe, is when J.P. Morgan has its earnings, which <clears throat> begins the whole cycle. This is going to be curious at a time when trading revenues are coming down, deal-making revenues are coming down, and lending very much in the forefront at a time of potential Credit yeah. restraint. <clears throat> talk about credit restraints. You, you know, we want to talk to people that know what they're doing. Publishing moments ago, Anurag Rana, who's expert on the cloud, expert on uh, 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 IBM. Uh, here's his initial take on the acquisition today of IBM of uh, Aptio. You think that's how you pronounce it, Lisa? Sounds about right. Uh, Aptio, $5 billion transaction. Smart move by the IBM CEO to add more software revenue to the overall sales mix. What I really find interesting here, Lisa, IBM is one of the few large tech companies that can actually get a deal done as regulators scrutinize any move by the bigger firms. To me, that's really interesting. That's they're, awesome. like, they're like J.P. Morgan. They're almost boxed out. Well, they don't have enough of a monopoly <clears throat> on the hot technology, and so they're allowed to make acquisitions. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think they're behind. So they get to make an act, yes. I think they get to make an acquisition um, as well. <coughs> Oil, 69.53 here. Foreign exchange just giving me no love today, dollar fractionally uh, weaker. I, I really thought we'd see more euro, 109.18, Lisa. Just, you know. Well, is this, a, I mean, again, I we've been talking about this all morning. Is this a tail risk <clears throat> that could potentially bolster the euro or potentially detract from it? It depends on which way it goes, and we just don't have enough information. It is not enough information, and it has been quiet information through this morning on Mr. Putin and Russia. Coming up next, Ian Bremmer, the Eurasia Group. Stay with us worldwide, Bloomberg Surveillance. We've seen some very serious cracks emerge. Um, you have uh, Prigozhin uh, publicly questioning 
the very premise for this uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine in the first place, uh, the notion that somehow Ukraine or NATO presented a threat to, uh, to Russia. Uh, you have someone challenging uh, Putin's leadership very publicly and very openly. Uh, and very openly. We see cracks uh, emerging where they go, if, if, if anywhere. Uh, wh when they get there, very hard to say. I don't want to speculate on it, uh, but I don't think we've seen the final act. The Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, there on ABC this weekend. That seems distant ago, Sunday morning. So much news has changed from Sunday morning and then into relative silence, Lisa, I would say, this morning. Yeah, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> just... Some nuances, but it's, it's really minimal. Yeah, well, what we're hearing is from a number of leaders around the world, the latest being NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg saying that the mutiny by uh, Brugosian <clears throat> of the Wagner Group highlights Vladimir Putin's mistakes. That's been one of the big takeaways, is that it does seem to have weakened his position, at least visually from the outside. What we are going to do now is speak to Ian Bremmer, president of Eurasia Group. He's author of The Power of Crisis and far more identifying the risks of the world at the beginning of the year with Bloomberg surveillance, uh, with all uh, the ten risks of the world, if you will, for 2023. I'm not sure this was on the risk, but here we are amid but this it was. crisis. It, it, it was, Tom. Um, <clears throat> no, it was number one. It was Just number one. Rogue, rogue Russia. You and I were there at the beginning of January. Well, thank you, and thank you for your guidance and leadership on that. Ian Bremer, I'm going to go to one statistic now in the Wall Street Journal, Federation of American Scientists. Russia has 1,674 deployed strategic weapons pointed at Europe and other points uh, as well. Brief us on the nuclear risk that we face this morning. Um, look, th this is uh, the most powerful rogue regime uh, on the world stage today by a very long margin. And Putin, who is facing unprecedented pressure from a disastrous <laughs> war on Ukraine that he has been fighting ineffectively for the last nearly year and a half, now also faces unprecedented challenge domestically to his own power over the last 48 hours, by far the worst 48 hours since he became president of Russia. This is a man who also controls the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. I, I don't think I need to spell out more clearly what an existential threat that poses um, to all of us, um, and he's a war criminal, and he's thought to be a war criminal by the entirety of the G7, the U.S., NATO, all of the American allies. It is very hard to find a way back from that, Tom. When you and I talk about <clears throat> war criminals, we talk about people like Bashir and Gaddafi. Right. Um, and and, <clears throat> and th those are people that, Milosevic, those are people that end up dead or in prison. But, you know, the only way to get from here to there with Putin involves an enormous amount of danger. And, and right. that's why the story with Mr. Prigozhin this weekend was so important. Ian, with your European Eurasia Group coverage, and I'm going to go back, I'm going to pick two presidents, and this is not political folks, but the angst over Dick Cheney years ago and some of the angst of the military over President Trump. Do you have an understanding of the military command and control of their missiles versus the very focus group in the Kremlin? Um. Look, the, the, I, I think that we have greater concern um, about the disposition, not just of Russia's nukes, but also its biological capabilities and its criminal cyber gangs who are the strongest and most capable of any country in the world. And that's all been um, you know, marshaled uh, through Russian state power. Um, and, you know, if you say how dangerous is that today, it, it, I do want to remind everybody that, you know, Putin's been tested in an unprecedented fashion, but none of his senior military advisors uh, or government leaders or major oligarchs blinked. None of them defected. None of them came out against Putin and his regime as Prigozhin and Wagner were marching on to Moscow, largely uncontested over the course of well, the weekend. 
hold so on a second. I, I don't think we have a reason to believe that there's a that there is a challenge to that today, but it's absolutely uncertain going forward. Do you think that Russia is more or less risky with Vladimir Putin still at the <clears throat> helm of this statehood, given that he is a known entity? Um, it, it would have been more risky under Prigozhin, but this is a clear case. I mean, Prigozhin is is, is you know, former convict massively emotionally unstable, uh, known torturer, personally responsible for lots of war crimes in Ukraine and elsewhere, also emotionally dealing with being on the front lines and facing the assassination of several close officers around him just in the past months. None of us can put ourselves in his emotional state right now. So, yeah, I think it would have been even more unstable under Prigozhin, definitely. But this is a clear case where the enemy of our enemy is our enemy. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there was anyone in NATO that was rooting for Prigozhin to take over right. in Moscow this weekend. How do you read the uh, interference or involvement of Xi Jinping's uh, uh, diplomats, the idea that they actually did hold discussions with <clears throat> Russia, with Vladimir Putin's right-hand men over the weekend, but didn't seem to get involved? That's right. The deputy foreign minister had a trip that had already been uh, scheduled uh, they certainly didn't cancel it. Uh, China basically discussed this as an internal Russian affair, which is pretty close to what NATO had to say. Uh, Putin facing the worst challenge of his career and his best friend on the global stage, Xi Jinping, offered no military support, offered no direct defense. Uh, I mean, you don't usually talk about Kazakhstan, but I'll mention it. A year and a half ago, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there was a coup in Kazakhstan, and Putin sent 2,000 paratroopers to help keep uh, President Tokayev's chestnuts out of the fire. And then just over this weekend, he said, hey, this is a Russian matter. I've got nothing to say. Putin really does not have real friends on the global stage. A lot of people want to buy his oil for cheap. A lot of people prepare to do business with him. A lot, not a lot of people prepare to take any domestic right. risk uh, to help him. Ian, is this an opportunity, given the shock of all this? We have no idea what's going to happen in the next 12 hours or 120 days. But is this the safe face moment where Turkey welcomes Sweden into NATO? Is it a big yes. enough deal where it's a change agent for a successfully elected Erdogan? I think that was going to happen anyway, but it probably happens more quickly now. Uh, I've, I saw uh, Stoltenberg from NATO <laughs> make some uh, statements in that direction in the last 24 hours. This is also an opportunity for the Ukrainians. They only have about two and a half of the 11 divisions that are in position and fully outfitted and trained by the Americans, by the UK, have been fighting in the counteroffensive thus far. They will certainly be more optimistic about being able to take more land. That counteroffensive had not gone very well over the past few weeks. So that's an opportunity. Um, there's also uh, the fact that Wagner Group is being liquidated. Their headquarters were raided over the weekend. Their mm -hmm. soldiers are going to have contracts for the Ministry of Defense. The ones that were involved directly in the fighting against Moscow, I'm sure, are not going to be fighting going forward. These men, a lot of them are former criminals. They're not trained. They're brutal in the field. They're more likely to engage in torture and other sorts of horrendous behaviors um, the fact that Wagner's being liquidated is good news for the world. Uh, and it's for Russia, for Ukraine, but also right. for countries like Mali and like Libya, where this, the Central African Republic, where they've been operating. It's a very good thing that the world's most powerful paramilitary organization with no oversight other than Putin is gone today. That's a good thing. Dr. Bremer, thank you so much for your time this morning. Ian Bremer of course, of Eurasia Group. I did not remember that. Of course, Ian remembered it because he wrote it up, and uh, I guess it is a victory lap, but he said it was the first risk this year and the top 10 risks of, I of, of January. Were, I, I do not remember it, and about that. There They it said is. there was a real instability <clears throat> in the biggest nuclear arsenal out there, and that was a big concern. Yeah, it is. Just to give you a sense, coming up on The Open, we'll be joining with uh, Troy Gajewski of FS Investments, J.P. Morgan, Stephanie Roth, and John Mackay of Schroeder's to talk about some of the machinations after potential geopolitical risks, but also uncertain, uncertainty economically as the world's leading central bankers head over to Sintra.
Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning, and we say good morning worldwide to you. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen. Uh, Lisa getting ready for a 9 o'clock soiree with important guests on Russia. I do want to point out in the 10 o'clock hour, Bloomberg Surveillance, excuse me, Bloomberg and Alex Steele and Guy Johnson will speak with General Ben Hodges, retired of the U.S. Army. Really looking forward uh, to that conversation as we talk to uh, the gentleman from the Air Force, the lieutenant general here. Uh, in the last half hour. Uh, the tape is better. <clears throat> That's what you need to know off the shock of all of the international events of the weekend. There was, I don't want to overdo it, a wait to the tape Sunday out of Asia into our morning, and it is improved. There's no other way uh, to state that. I've got fractional green on the screen in a NASDAQ 100. Dow, uh, SPX is zero, essentially. That's very important. But just as important, the two-year yield space improves a little bit. What has not improved is curve inversion. Right now, I've got a true 103 basis points on the 2s, 10s uh, spread, <coughs> and that is uh, really something. And that is a source of study for our next guest. I got a huge response the last time Michael Darda was on. He's chief economist, macro strategist, Roth, MKM Partners. We're going to revisit today and really focus and some of the certitudes out there and the lack of patience over watching recession uh, indicators. Mike Dowder, thank you so much for joining. We see this shocking curve inversion now reinvert almost through March maximum version on the vanilla spread, the 210 spread. You look at other spreads. Why are we impatient on the signals of inversion? Thanks for having me on, Tom. I think we're impatient simply because the yield curve is a long leading indicator with a lot of historical variation between inversion and subsequent recession. Uh, based on the 10-year to one-year Treasury spread, that's the one we focus on. Recessions have occurred anywhere between seven months and 25 months uh, post-inversion with the average outcome uh, 12 to 14 months. So we're 11 months into inversion on that specific yield curve. And so it's just premature to say, oh, the statute of limitations is now up. We've been inverted for too long and the economy is held up. We are slowing. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but the recession debate continues to go on. But this always happens, Tom. You've been around for a couple cycles now. <laughs> the, when the yield curve inverts, the macro data and even risk markets, you know, do tend to hold up for some time. And so right. the perception is it's different this time. You know, it's a false signal. And, you know, the, you know, the, the it's different this time uh, phrase is really the most dangerous in, in economic forecast. As, as we move forward, do we disinflate? Oh, no doubt about it. Uh, you can already see that in this slowing trend for nominal GDP. And in fact, you know, on the income side, nominal gross domestic income is essentially flatlined. We're negative now two quarters in a row on GDI. And so that divergence is something to keep an eye on from a recessionary uh, perspective. You know, the last time we saw divergences between GDI and GDP was just before the 1990-91 and 07-09 recession started. And so we can see that deceleration in nominal in the nominal aggregates and inflation tends to follow the business cycle. Uh, you know, it's a lagging indicator. So wages and especially rents tend to be tied to leases and contracts. Uh, right. So specifically the core inflation rates, they are coming down, but you know, they're still elevated and they will continue to come down on the back of slower nominal spending. And that that's really the key variable as to whether the Fed has tightened or eased. Is nominal growth decelerating or accelerating? It's decelerating and decelerating sharply, and there's more deceleration ahead. Well, if this, you is, this is critical, uh, Michael Darda, on nominal growth, adding real GDP in some form of inflation statistic. Are you suggesting we get to sub 5% nominal GDP? I think a lot of people out there aren't expecting that. We're already there, Tom, uh, on the gross domestic income figures, and those tend to be a better barometer of where uh, GDP will be revised to in the future. So we're limping along at barely 1% annualized nominal for GDI. Now, you know, nominal GDP is still up in the you know mid fives, uh, or if you take right. a two 
or average a bit higher. So, you know, a 4% trend would be consistent with about See, a 2% is... inflation rate. And I think we're going to get there, if not fall below that, um, you know, in the in the near future. Just surveillance warning on a Monday. This is what happens when you have someone from the University of Wisconsin on. They go all GDI, GDP on you. Darda was the only one in his class who actually passed the exam on GDI when he was like 17 uh, years old. Michael, let's translate this to the stock market. There's a P, there's an E, or maybe there's a P and there's a cash flow. A lot of people are focused on earnings lessening or flattening. Even if I get earnings flattening, can I get multiple expansion? Well, you have been getting it this year. I mean, this run up in the equity market has largely been driven by the multiple. And in my mind, I think that puts us in a bit of a dangerous place uh, because at a 19 times forward multiple on the S&P 500, <clears throat> Uh, with elevated recession risk still in front of us, I don't think that's a particularly good risk reward for you know for most investors. Uh, if we look at what's driven the S and P 500 this year, obviously it's been this outperformance in a handful of growth stocks. So the Infotech index is actually up at a 27 multiple. We haven't seen anything like that since late 2021, Tom, and that preceded just preceded a more than 30 percent collapse for the sector. Now, because market interest rates are higher than they were in late 2021, the equity risk premium on the infotech sector is actually negative for the first time since June of 2007. Also, not a particularly good time to be running right. with the bull. Michael Darda, thank you so much for the uh, guidance. He's with Roth MKM. Uh, Michael Darda there with some real caution from a guy who's congenitally optimistic. So that's a challenge uh, to say the least. I got a little bit of a lift to the tape all around uh, seeing a, a better stock market futures with SPX exactly flat, Dow a little positive, NASDAQ up fractionally uh, as well. Don't want to make too much about it as we wait for news on Russia. There was a bombshell this morning on Wall Street. I had a wonderful panel years ago at Davos with Mr. Montag of Bank of America, and he is a straight-talking, different person. Shanali Basic knows this. He's a cut from a cloth from another time. She's our Wall Street correspondent on this. Did you see this coming, that Mr. Montag would go back to the mothership? No. To your point, he had worked at Goldman Sachs, left for Bank <clears> of America, <throat> helped make it a trading powerhouse. Some would say saved it. Let's not mince words. But remember, when he left in 2021, it was after a string of news that really questioned the culture under Tom Montag. There's a few things going on. It's his <clears> grand return to Wall Street, the board of Goldman Sachs. There's only about just over a dozen people already on this board, very closely knit board, at a time where there are a lot of questions about the culture at Goldman Sachs. Remember, Remember, we're only a couple weeks away from a story that was in the journal entitled Goldman right. Sachs is at war with itself. So does Tom mm. Montag, who has long worked with David Solomon, seen as a closer ally to him, start to bring the bank back together and really secure the idea here that David Solomon can well, bring the ring in the, in the upset of Goldman over the last three or four days, and we're not going to go into all the soap opera about it in that, Solomon was at Bear Stearns. And then he and Montag know each other, right? Mm -hmm. So Solomon brought him back. In that process, who does Solomon go to to say, I want the guy from Bank of America to come back to Goldman Sachs? Well, it's interesting because it's not just Solomon. <clears throat> yes, he's the chairman of the board at Goldman Sachs, but there is still an entire board here. Yeah. And you think about, you know, who are the key players? One of those very key players is the secretary to the board, John Rogers, who has worked for CEO after CEO over at Goldman Sachs. And the sense here is that you really can't lose his uh, confidence. Goldman Sachs is not going <clears> to <throat> make fickle decisions here. Year. Yes, there were huge pivots in strategy. Yes, it's, there's been a lot of griping, but this is year five for David well, Solomon, uh, so certainly a sensitive time. Of Kate Kelly's article in 2021, huge long article, and Tom Montag is a, is a dinosaur from Wall Street. He's like a dinosaur like me. He's, he's doing better than me. Uh, but, you know, Mont Montag from another time and place talking about work from home and all that, he was dead set against it, what's he going to bring to the board? He's not going to tell them how to construct swap contracts. <laughs> well, one thing that's interesting, <clears throat> one is just confidence in David. That's number one. Number two, and, and this is, by the way, a very astute way to explain the story here from the scoop from Sridhar Natarajan and Catherine Doherty, because remember, this is, again, a question of uh, the next 
five years at Goldman, not the last five under David. But remember, while we talk about consumer, you talk about it all the time. It's a drop in the bucket. It had been a drop in the bucket for Goldman's revenue. They had been performing and beating on their core business lines. They have expanded their lead in mergers and acquisitions in the last couple of years. Their trading desks have done extraordinarily well, although then what's the, the time problem? This, this is what I don't get. I mean, over the weekend, there was a lot of gossip, just outright gossip, which we don't do on this bank. And all of its centers around OMG, David screwed it up. Has he? Well, the gossip has been for months, isn't it? Not even just this weekend. Uh, I don't know if you've been hanging out in the Hamptons too, Tom. I know <laughs> you like to talk about it. But at the same time, remember, there's a question of why does Goldman need to be something else? Why can't Goldman just do what it does best, win at trading, win at investment banking? I think that's currently the existential question for Goldman. I mean, I mean, what is Monte going to do on the board? I, I don't understand. You know, David Vineyard, I got an idea what he does on the board. The former CFO. I, I, I get that. What does he do on the board? Well, it's Cheerlead? <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, listen, one of the big questions here is we've heard this griping that came out of Goldman for months now, mm -hmm. right? A lot of leaking to the press. A lot of issues. Yeah. yeah. But the question here is when do those <clears throat> problems become an actual business problem for Goldman Sachs? There's a sense here that there needs to be a bringing of people together to stop the complaining and to stop the leaks so that this doesn't become a bigger problem. Was he Goldman pushed Sachs. out of Bank of America? That's sort of in, in Kate Kelly's story. It's sort of a variable here. When you talk yeah. to Shree, I mean, they go out for drinks, folks, you know, like like they work. Sonali works like a six hour day and heads out for beverages. And, and, and there's the gossip. Was he pushed out at Bank of America? So two things here. I went back to see exactly how this had happened. And remember, when he had stepped down, he wasn't the only one to step down. And Finnegan had stepped down around the same mm -hmm. time. And it was painted as a way to kind of clear Generational the thing for the next the set of ranks. Right, right, but remember, right. it did come in the wake of that very, <clears throat> very explosive story to the point that not only Bank of America, but Brian Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of America, had publicly defended Tom Montag pretty seriously. And remember, these weren't just work-from-home issues. No. There are questions about whether women were allowed to be objectified in that culture. There were people who were afraid of losing their jobs. We will see. We've got red and green on the screen right now. In the NASDAQ 100, I got a very constructive tone to the tape. This off of four or five hours ago. We're waiting for news from Russia. Maria Tadeo in Brussels looking at that very carefully. The Standard & Poor's 500, fractional down three tenths of a percent. We say good morning to all of you on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television, a conversation with Shanali Basak, our chief layoff correspondent. Over the weekend, if there hadn't been Goldman Sachs, over the weekend, if there hadn't been all of the international relations in Russia, there would have been no other topic. J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, layoffs. Are they just getting out front of a very difficult summer? Is it a summer of our discontent? The part that is so disheartening for so many people is, remember, Goldman set out to cut many thousands of jobs. And when they initially did that at the end of last year, early this year, there was a sense that they're going deep so that they don't have to go deeper. So to see these additional job cuts over at Goldman Sachs and then to see Citigroup and J.P. Morgan make the cuts by the dozens, it's surgical, isn't it? We're not talking about thousands of people being cut again. But yes, this is happening in fits and starts. <coughs> And the worry okay. here is how far does it go? What, what's the character of those managing directors? I mean, is it, is it all IB? Is it all the SPAC crew out? You four guys, you do SPACs, goodbye. There's a lot of that, and but you can also <clears throat> say a lot of that has already happened. And so remember, deals themselves have been muted. A lot of types of underwriting have been muted. IPOs are really only just starting to come back. And people had hired so intensely in previous years. At what point does the market come back that dramatically to have all these people on staff? I will say there's also a lot of movement, Tom, in the positive direction. You're seeing a lot of star bankers starting to move around to different firms. So not all is bad out there, but it's a tense time. Shalani Basak, thank you so much. Sri Natarajan uh, with an important story here. And Mr. Montag uh, retired from Bank of America, going back to Goldman Sachs on the board amid industry layoffs, to say the least. Futures at negative two, the 10-year yield 3.68%. On radio, on television, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. When you start to introduce geopolitical risks like what we're seeing, the one thing is the market tends to be very bad at pricing out these risks 
from a left tail and a right tail perspective. So overall, if you're going to put tail hedges on some sort of index proxy, like an Apple, for instance, those are quite inexpensive because what happens is if it becomes more unstable, you get a correlated move down. That's what we've seen historically. Amy Wu Silverman, she was outstanding, folks, on notional derivative value. This is an inside baseball Global Wall Street item right now. If you are part of Global Wall Street, go look for our full conversation with Amy Wu Silverman today. She was absolutely brilliant on the derivative buildup that Lawrence McDonald wrote about 10 days ago that was such a kerfuffle over a uh, a given weekend. Really can't say enough about that conversation. We continue strong on the surprises of this 2023 market. Gina Martin Adams joined us. She just put in a buy order for 100 shares of NVIDIA to get her Monday started. She's chief equity strategist. I know, Gina, you've never seen anything like this. I'll cut to the chase. For mere mortals that don't own NVIDIA, is it broadening out? In fits and starts is the best answer that I can give you right now, Tom. What we've gotten so far this year is anomalous, but not completely historically anomalous. There were two other periods in time in which we saw the top stocks in the index outperform to such an extensive degree. 2020 was one of those times. In that bull market of 2020, we did see very concentrated gains ultimately broaden out as economic recovery came to the fore later that year. So it is possible we will continue to see broadening. Many people are simply looking back at 2000, which was the other instance of concentration risk, such as that which we have experienced so far this year. And in that case, of course, we had the opposite scenario where ultimately those uh, flying stars started to crash down to earth. So many are fearful of that. We actually do think we will see some broadening. We saw that in early June. Much of that broadening has been offset by some downdraft in some of these high-flying stocks. And I think as we go through the rest of this year, we'll see that 2024 should look like a better economic year yeah. than 2023. And the result will be a broadening equity advance. Uh, Gina, part of the CMT, the CFA curricula, is real simple. Study history. And one of the great mm -hmm. histories, as Amy Wu Silverman alluded to earlier this morning, is the shadows, the opacity of the derivative structure. Are you concerned and is Bloomberg Intelligence concerned about the derivative leverage or notional value overlaying our core equity holdings? Are there excesses in 2023? Look, I think that as market cap accelerates, derivative exposure accelerates as well. And in particular, in this kind of climate where we have very little visibility as to where the economy is going, very little confidence as to where the earnings stream is going, a lot of uncertainty with respect to interest rate risk. People are not taking long cash positions. They're actually playing on the margins, and that's resulting in this derivative bubble, if you will. I do think, though, that as the year progresses, what we'll find is the confidence does start to improve, and that creates... <clears throat> some general broadening of exposure, some um, greater confidence in the outlook, which allows people to take longer term positions rather than a lot of these short term playing around the margins. So I, I think that a lot of it depends upon how we move going forward. If we end up with a very onerous response to higher interest rates, which is mm -hmm. a, a bigger crash than anticipated, we could be in trouble because a lot of those exposures have to unwind. Right. But I do right. think that generally, as long as the economic outlook goes as the consensus anticipates, which is a very modest recession, uh, followed by recovery into 2024, the broad, the market sort of structure should shift a little bit. And investors should get a little <clears throat> bit more confident taking those longer term exposures, investing in right. stocks again. We just haven't been there this year. Uh, you know, I had it up earlier. Apple, we're on the three trillion watch. It's two point nine three six. Uh, trillion for Apple. It just and They're not even up, folks. They're up like 40-some percent versus others to the moon as well. Do you acquire marginal shares in tech? I mean, I know you don't do buy, hold, sell. Right. But what are your thoughts if somebody says, OMG, I've got to sell tech? How do you respond to that? Yeah, I think, frankly, at this stage in the cycle, there's a lot of actually fundamental support for the tech call, the tech broad call. Now, this is not specific to stocks, and, and certainly Apple and Microsoft are very large entities within the tech space and do tend to drive a lot of those trends. But what we're detecting in our sector scorecard, which is you know a, a very quantitatively driven model that allows us to 
defined for best potential performance among sectors, this sector scorecard does, does promote tech as well as communication stocks, as well as consumer discretionary stocks and industrial. So those four segments are toward the top of the scorecard. The reason why tech is toward the top of the, score, top of the scorecard is because there is an underlying earnings recovery emerging. Remember, last year was one of the worst years ever for these stocks' performance, tech, communications, all of them underperformed. The biggest stocks in the index underperformed throughout the entirety of 2022. So some of 2023 is just a bounce back. But also, we had a tremendous earnings recession in this space. Earnings fell by 20, 25, in some cases, 30 percent throughout 2022. And we're starting to see earnings recovery emerge. So what we've got in the stock prices is, is, you know, a reflection in large in large part from what 2022's <clears throat> experience was now happening in 2023 and also a reflection in the earnings cycle and an inflection in margins for this space. <clears throat> and that's creating a degree of optimism. Frankly, that's supported by fundamentals. I, mean, I look at the fundamentals and to me, I'm going to link them back as Michael Darty did moments ago to the, the gamble, the bet, the speculation, the hope even that nominal GDP will collapse. What is the Bloomberg Intelligence revenue growth model relative to the boom revenue in selected areas of the pandemic or, frankly, back to 2019? Yeah, I think this is a really good point because revenue is a risk into the second half. And we've got this really unique experience right now where most of the recovery in the earnings stream that's likely to happen into the second half is because margins recover on account of that inflation downdraft or that deceleration in inflation, which has been really key to creating some margin stabilization. At the same time, revenue growth does decelerate significantly. Our model suggests that actually the offsets of those things results in about a 5% downdraft in earnings growth over the course of the next 12 months. Recall, this is in addition to the already 10% downdraft that we've experienced when we exclude the energy sector or when we look at a S&P 500 earnings on an unadjusted basis. So this is a persistence of a recession as opposed to suddenly we're falling into recession. And that timing is very, very consequential for stocks. Remember, stocks follow earnings. They don't follow the economy. So even as the economy decelerates, if you've got revenue decelerating, but that's offset, by some easing inflation pressures, your, your impact on earnings growth could actually be net positive. And I think that's going to emerge into 2024. That could be what the market has been trading on so far this year is this idea that the earnings distress that we experienced over the last 12 months really comes to an end and comes to an end before the economy starts to turn over, at least if most economic forecasts are true. <clears throat> Gina, thank you so much. Gina Martin-Adams with an equity brief there. As I said last week, my head was spinning and one of the great foundational beliefs of Martin Adams, you've got to be in the market. You don't hear go to cash from her uh, too often. I want to summarize where we are at 854 Wall Street time. We welcome all of you worldwide on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg uh, Television. We've been trying to talk to individuals about the belief forward given hugely, hugely small news flow. Was there speculation over the weekend? Yes. This morning, there's any number of themes and then silence. For example, one theme out there is that the gentleman from Wagner, uh, Prigozhin, will face charges. It says Russia state media, that from the FT. Bloomberg has that and others have it as well. And there's also the idea, the uncertainties there of where everyone is right now, including Mr. Putin. Maybe some of these answers will be uh, given to us through uh, the days. We've lined up a terrific number of guests. I do want to commend you in the 10 o'clock hour. Ben Hodges will join us, the former general of the United States uh, Army. Alina Polakaiva will join us as well. She's brilliant with huge value out on Twitter <clears throat> over the weekend. Ian Bremmer joined us an hour ago, and he has just published his Monday note. And he has a concept here. I don't think it's original to Bremmer, but it's something that's certainly he and Eurasia Group are expert on. And that is the near abroad. And without question, what I have to study forward is this interesting Belarus to the north of Ukraine, and clearly the near abroad for a struggling uh, Vladimir Putin. A major shout out from John Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and myself to our team who worked tirelessly through the weekend to bring you our expert voices. Futures negative two, this 
is Bloomberg Surveillance.